What is the truth about Islam? Today we're going to be talking about and uncovering the secret hidden truths and mysteries about Islam and also how Islam came to be a religion and we're going to be talking about things that you probably did not know, hidden histories and hidden secrets and mysteries that will be revealed to you today because the truth will be revealed today. We will also be quoting from texts such as the Quran, the Hadith, and we will also be using modern standard Arabic for this video in particular. Now on this channel, I've covered every other world religion, majorly speaking, but the only one I've yet to cover until now is Islam, and you're going to see the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We will be going over three major parts in this video, the cultural, the historical, and also the spiritual side of Islam. And we're going to start with the cultural side because there are many similarities when it comes to the Arab culture and also the ancient Yaudium Hebrew culture too. Now I will be showing you some similarities between the two, some that you've probably have known before, but there are others that you might have not known. Now we're going to start with traditional headwear and clothing, because in traditional Muslim headwear, there are headwears that women wear, such as a hijab, a khador, a niqab, and a burqa, as you can see right here, that's commonly worn throughout the Muslim world for women. And this is similar to scriptural times also because back then during the scriptural times the women also wore head coverings too and the Yaudium Hebrew women are wearing head coverings also. This is a portrayal of Zipporah who was the Kushite wife of Musa or Masha commonly known to most as Moses right here. This is Hannah, also known as Cana, the mother of Samawal, or also known as Shamual, Samuel. And what you see is that the traditional Hebrew clothing and outfits worn by women is also the same and very similar to the traditional outfits that's worn by Muslim and Arab women. In many traditional Eastern religions, you see the use of turbans that are worn. Well, turbans were also worn in scriptural times because we even see Harun, who is also known as Aaron, wearing a turban in the book of Leviticus chapter 8 verses 9, quoted from the Torah or the Torah. This is a picture of Masha, who is also known as Musa in the Arabic, commonly known to most as Moses. And yes, the people of scripture were dark skinned back then, and I've done plenty of videos on this fact. In Islamic law, pork is typically banned from consumption, and this is the exact same thing that's also found in the Hebrew Yaudium culture also from the Torah where pork is banned. Now I'll be sharing with you some very similarities between the Arabic language and also the ancient Hebrew language known as Yaudiyat. Now please keep in mind, this is not from a Jewish perspective, nor am I Jewish, or do I refer to any type of religion. Rather, this is from the truth perspective, so you can see the real similarities and how much has been hidden from you, because they do not want you to know the truth about your language and your creator and the name of your creator, but you're about to see the truth right now with both your eyes open. And now we will be going over the similarities between Arabic and also the language of the scriptures because you're going to find a whole lot of similarities indeed. The very first similarity actually is that both languages are written from right to left and they are read from right to left. I know there are different types of Arabic that are used depending on which nation you go to in the Arab world, but for this video specifically, we will be quoting using the modern standard Arabic. 
Now what you probably did not know and some more hidden history about the Arab language is that it's from the Semitic languages as you can see right here. So it comes from Central Semitic, West Semitic. It is a Semitic Afro-Asiatic language from that language family. And according to Omniglot, the Arabic script evolved from the Nabataean Aramaic script. Arabic has also been written with the Hebrew, Syriac, and Latin scripts also. The reason this is so important is because Arabic and Hebrew are very similar and it evolved from the Aramaic script, which is also the modern Hebrew that's used by the Jewish people today. Now this is the standard modern Hebrew language right here that's commonly used and spoken by the Jewish people today and you see that there are many similarities but what you probably did not know is that there was a language even before this that was used and spoken by the people of scripture commonly known as the Paleo-Hebrew and also known as the Phoenician script which was a universal language that was used all across the world thousands of years ago even during the time of of King David or Dawood and I'm going to show this to you and prove this to you archaeologically in the video to come. The reason this is so important is because this language right here, the modern Hebrew, was not used during the time of Musa or commonly known as Moses. This language was not used during the time of the Old Testament so-called. But rather this language was adopted by the Yaudium Hebrew people after the Babylonian captivity and that's why this language is similar to Aramaic and we will be quoting using the Yaudith or also known as Paleo-Hebrew language in a moment to come which I will show you if you have not already seen it but now I'm showing you once again the Arabic alphabet and for those who don't know the Arabic alphabet consists of 28 letters in the modern standard and out of those letters three of them are vowels the Alif right here is a vowel the Wa is a vowel and the Ya is a vowel they can be used as short and long vowels in the language while the rest of the 25 letters are consonants. Now this is the Yaudiath language right here and like I said earlier this language precedes and comes before the modern Hebrew language that's used by the Jewish people today and this is the language right here that much of the Old Testament was written in and this is the language of the people in the scriptures and I'm going to be showing you that archaeologically speaking also. Now as you can see just like the modern Hebrew there are a total of 22 letters that are in this language. Many of these letters that are very similar to the Arabic language also. Now back then during the ancient times and even with languages such as the ancient Egyptian language you'll see that many of the letters and characters represent a picture and are very pictographic because the letter actually means something and actually can mean a picture if not a sentence and speaking of this language this language each letter has a numerical value just like the modern Hebrew. And we will be going over each letter and then talking about the similarities between Arabic. So the first letter right here is all or known as Aleph in the modern Hebrew and it looks like an ox head right there. And it makes an A sound. The next letter is the Bath right here or the Bot which makes a B sound and it looks like and resembles a house. The next letter is a Gom which represents the foot and it makes the G sound. This fourth letter right here represents the Dal or the Dalit which means door. It represents a door. The next letter is Ha or Ah which means window or behold. The next letter is pronounced like an U. Now in modern Hebrew they pronounce it as a vav but the difference with this language is that it's an oo and makes the oo sound and it represents a nail. This letter right here is a zan. It represents a weapon and makes the z sound. This letter is a hot right there or a kat and it makes the kh sound similar to ha in the Arabic and it represents right here the wall of separation. This is a tat which makes the t sound and means surround or even basket. This letter right here is a ya and makes the y sound and it also represents hands, work, 
deed, this letter is a cop or a calf right here and represents the palm of a hand and makes the K sound. This is a lam right here and makes the L sound and means a staff or to lead. This is a mom which makes the M sound and it represents waters or chaos. This is a noon which makes the N sound and it represents life or seed or fish. This is a samak right here and it looks like a staff that's being supported. The reason it looks like that is because it means to support and it makes the S sound. This is an ayan and it makes the A sound similar to the ayin in the modern Hebrew. And it represents the I to see, experience. This is a pa, which makes the P sound, and it means word or mouth or speak. This is a tzad right here, and if you look very closely, it looks like a fish hook right there, and it makes the TS sound, very reminiscent to the country of Chad, which is pronounced tzad. This letter right here is a kuf, which makes the Q sound, and it looks like a sun behind a horizon because it represents behind. This letter is a rosh right here, which makes the R sound, and it means first or chief. This letter is a shan right here, which makes the SH sound, and it means teeth or to consume or to destroy. Now, although this letter is known as a tav in the modern Hebrew, in our language it's known as the tu or the thu, and the reason it's known like that is because it makes the th sound, and it looks like an x because this means mark or sign or covenant. And the reason why this is so important is because it represents the sign, the mark that was given to Musa regarding the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the seventh day of rest. And note how it looks like an X. Please keep this in mind later on in the video. Here is a chart also of the language where you can actually see each of the letter from the late to the middle to the early. And here's the Paleo Ancient right here and even a more ancient one. You can also see the picture of the pictographic meaning. It also gives the meaning and definition right here, the sound that it makes. And it also gives the modern Hebrew, the Greek, and the Latin equivalent. And it lists all the letters right here. And I'll be sure to link this in the description box below if you would like to take a look at this more on your own time. And like we said earlier, each of these letters right here, they each also have a numerical value starting with the number one right here for all or Aleph as it's commonly known, all the way to Thu, which is the last letter of the alphabet, which has a numerical value of the number 400. And if you would like to take a look at this, you can pause the video and see for yourself as I've already listed the numbers for you. But now we will go over and compare the similarities with this language in Arabic. For example, the very first letter of the Yaudiyath language is Al, or commonly known as Aleph in the modern Hebrew. This is the same first letter in the Arabic known as Alif. And then you also have the Mom right here, which makes the M sound and is the letter M. Just like in Arabic, you have the Meme. And also the letter Noon right here, just like the letter Noon in the Arabic. It's the exact same thing, the exact same pronunciation. And there are other similarities here too that you can see, just like the Yah right here, there's also the letter Yah in the Arabic, which is also a vowel in the last letter of the alphabet. There's also the Ain in the Arabic. This is the Ayan in the Yaudiath language. You also have the Lam right here in the Yaudiath language, which is also very similar and drawn very similar actually to the lamb right here in Arabic. You see how they're very similar? They're just drawn a little bit differently. And the same is true with the scene and the sheen in the Arabic. You see how it's drawn right here with the three dots on top to make the sheen. This is also similar to the shan in the Yaudiath language, which is the second to last letter in the alphabet because there are 22 letters in this language. But you see how the shape is very similar. So there are a ton of similarities. 
Now the translators have done a great job attempting to hide this language and the reason that they've tried to hide it is because they know that this was the language that scripture was in fact written in. But what they try to tell you is that with the modern Hebrew there are vowel points that are needed because in the ancient Hebrew languages there were no vowels but this is actually not true. In the ancient Hebrew languages there are vowels, there are 22 letters, but there are a total of five vowels. And if you would like to learn more about the language, I've done two videos on this so far covering Hebrew and the ancient Hebrew. So if you would like to take a look at them, please look in the description box below for those videos and also the eight part series that talks more about the language in detail. Now this is the same Yaudiath language that precedes and comes before the Hebrew language that's used by the Jewish today. As you can see, the letters that are outlined in the orange right here, these are the vowels. There are five vowels in this language. As you can see, the all is a vowel, the ha, the u is a vowel also, the ya, and then the ayan right here. And as you can see, three of the five vowels here are similar and exactly the same as the three Arabic vowels, and they are the al or the alif, which is the same first letter in the Arabic alphabet, then the ya, and also the u right here, because this is pronounced as an u. Now in Judaism, they tell you it's pronounced like a w, like a wall, but it's actually like an u. And once again, the three vowels are the alif, which is right here in the Arabic, and then the wa, which is right here, and the ya, which is right here. But they also have short and long form vowels also. And when it comes to the Arabic short vowels, they make the exact same sounds as the Yaudium ancient Hebrew vowels also that we just went over. So for example, the fata alif makes the a sound. And then there's the Duma, which is the short vowel of the Wa that makes the U sound. And then the Kasra of the Ya, which makes the E sound. So you have A, U, E. Why is that so important? Because these vowels are derived from the Yaudiath vowels here too, because the all makes the a sound also. And then this letter right here, which is the u in the Yaudiath language, makes the u sound. And then the ya sound right here to get the y, just like in Arabic also. And so when you start to break it down completely, you see that nearly half of the Arabic language actually derives from the ancient Yaudiath language, which is the same language that Musa or Moses and the people of old in the scriptures actually used and wrote with. Because as we just gone over, the all right here is similar to the alif, and notice how that they have the exact same first letter in both their alphabets. The bat or the bath right here is similar to the ba, which notice how in both Arabic and in Yaudiath, they both have the second letter of the alphabet. They have the exact same letter right here, which is the noon, and then also the mom right here, or the meme in Arabic. The ein, although it is not considered a vowel in Arabic, it's similar to the ayan because they make the same similar sound actually. And then as we just went over with the vowel ya, they have the same sound right here as you can see. The shan right here, which makes the sh sound, just like with the sheen in the Arabic, the only difference is the three dots on top. And even with this letter right here, this is the zan, which makes the z sound in the Yaudiath language. Well, in the Arabic, there's the zane, which also makes the z sound. There's also the kop right here. Now in Arabic, there's the calf and the cough also. The lamb and the lam right here, and also the u and the wa, which both are vowels. So you see and have an idea and a gist of the similarities and how similar these languages really are. This is a chart that shows you the alphabet evolution of the different letters and how they've gone from Arabic to Hebrew to Syriac and then also to Greek in the common letters that we see today used in the Latin script. But what this is just doing is this is giving you an idea of how these letters evolved and the similarities between them and also the origins of Arabic and where much of the Arabic language originates from. 
The University of California, Davis, also agrees that Arabic belongs to the Semitic or Shemitic family of languages, which also includes Aramaic, Amharic, Tigray, and Hebrew that's spoken in Israel today. Now, one of the languages that we just went over, which is the Paleo-Hebrew, which is the one that comes before, is also known as Phoenician and seen in Phoenician also. These languages that are Afro-Asiatic are also called Proto-Semitic languages too, according to BYU, so you see how similar they really are. Also, note the similarities between the numbers when it comes to Hebrew and Arabic. So, for example, the number four is Arba or Arba'a in the Hebrew, in Arabic it's Arba. Now, the ancient Hebrew is pronounced a little bit different from the modern, but in the ancient Hebrew, number five would be pronounced Kamasha. In Arabic, it's pronounced Hamza. Number seven is Shaba'a in the ancient Hebrew. It's Sabah in Arabic. And then number nine is pronounced Tasha'a in the ancient Hebrew. In Arabic, it's pronounced Tisa. So there are many similarities with the numbers also. Another similarity to note is the use of similarities in the language when it comes to certain words. Like for example, Salam or Shalom or Shalom in the ancient Hebrew, which of course means peace be unto you. Note how they use very similar letters. They use the mom or the meme for the M. And then right here, they use the seen or the shan and then the lamb or the lam and then the alif and the u. So very similar indeed. More examples of this includes the word day, for example. The word day in English is yam in the Arabic, but in Arabic it uses three distinct letters. It uses the ya and then the wa right here, so the two vowels, and then the meme right there. Well, just like in the Yaudiath language, it's the same three letters. It's the ya, and then it's the u, and then it's the mom to get the word yum, which also means day in the Yaudiath or the Hebrew language, the exact same letters. And note how in the Arabic, the ya and the wa are vowels. It's the same thing for the Yaudiath too. Another commonality is the word night, because the word night in Arabic is layal, which is right here. It has the lamb, and then the ya, and then another lamb right here, so it has three letters. But if you actually take a look at it here, it can also have the fourth letter at the end of it here. In the Yaudiath language, it would be layala, which is the lam right here, and then the yod right there, and then the lam again, and then the ha at the end, but it uses the same first three letters. It's also true for the word kingdom because in Arabic, the word kingdom means mamlaka. Well, mamlaka has five letters and it uses five letters. It uses the meme twice, as you can see right here, and then it uses the lamb because we go from right to left, and then it uses here the calf right here, as you can see, which is the fourth letter, and then the fifth letter right there is the marbuta. And the marbuta is the feminine words when there is a ha, but there are two dots right above it. And just like in the Hebrew, it's the exact same word as you can see, pronounced mam laka, which comes from malk or malak, which means king. And you see there's the two moms right there, and then there's the lamad right here, the kop right here, and then the ha right there. Very similar to Arabic, very interesting and suspicious indeed. Why am I sharing all of this with you and why is this so important to know? Because they are hiding something from you. The elite have gone out of their way to keep this hidden from you for thousands of years until now, until today. And that is the true restored name of our creator. And I'm going to tell you why it's not Allah. And I'm going to prove that to you also with archaeological evidence from scripture itself. But the reason this is so important is because it's important to know names. What is your name? Or also in Arabic, masmuka, masmuki. 
because we can all agree that scripture was in fact written in Hebrew or the ancient Hebrew. So if we can all agree on that one simple fact, then it would only make sense that our creator would have a Hebrew name. And that's what's so important about this. And I talk about this in my other videos too, the importance of names and why they matter. So if all of the prophets and the people of scripture were calling on a Hebrew name for thousands and thousands of years, which we're also going to go over archaeologically speaking, why all of a sudden did it change to L-O-R-D in the English, and why all of a sudden did it change to A-L-L-A-H in the Arabic, even though these languages were not spoken back then? And it's also the same with names. Whatever your name is in your respective language, that will always be your name regardless of where you go, regardless of any other languages being spoken. So here's an example. If your name is Khadijah, or if your name is Abdul, or if your name is Abdallah, that is your name in the Arabic, regardless of what country you go to. So if you go to France and they start speaking French, your name is still going to be Khadijah or Abdul or Abdallah, no matter what. If you go to a different country and they speak a different language, you're still going to have the same Arabic name. And even if your name is Yahya, which means John in Arabic, well, if you go to a different place, your name is still going to be Yahya. You're still going to want to be referred to as Yahya, even though there is an English equivalent of John and even a French equivalent of Johan. If somebody calls you John or Johan, you're not going to respond to that because that is not your name in your respective language. Your name is Yahya. You have an Arabic name name so you would like to go by your Arabic name not by any other equivalent regardless of the language. Now this concept of names and the importance of names are way more important in Eastern cultures than in Western cultures because names represent identity. Names represent who you are. Names represent personality. They represent character. They represent the uniqueness of a person. Even though some names are very common, your name is still your name and it represents who you are. It is a piece of who you are. And contrary to the Western thought, this same concept is also important in the Yaudium Hebrew culture because yes, the scriptures are a cultural historical book. They are not a religious text about Christians or Jewish people. The same is true for our creator's name and the name of our creator. And I know you've been told that the name of our creator is Allah. Well, you've been lied to. They've been lying to you and covering up the truth for so long. And you're going to see the truth for yourself right now. Because Allah simply means God in the English. It is a title. It is not a name. Names and titles are different. And I've also talked about this with words such as Lord and also with words such as God. Those are not names. Those are titles. Think about it like this. If you go by a title, so let's say if you go by Dr. Khan, well, the word doctor is not your name. The word doctor is a title. Khan is your name, but doctor is not your name. The same is true when it comes to our creator. Just like our creator has a Hebrew name because scripture was written in the Hebrew, we know that the prophets of old, so the prophets of what you call Musa, who's commonly known as Moses, and all the other ones, Abraham, or as you know as Ibrahim, they all spoke Hebrew, and they all wrote in Hebrew, so therefore our creator would have a Hebrew name, not an Arabic title. And this is so very important because there is no archaeological evidence of Moses or Abraham or any of the Old Testament prophets or even who are considered prophets in the Quran. There is no evidence of any of them using Allah or any of them using and speaking Arabic of old. The only one that you see is Muhammad. So you mean to tell me that they went by a name in the ancient Hebrew for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but then all of a sudden, 500 years after the Messiah, Messiah, or even 600 years after, all of a sudden the name was changed to an Arabic title, even though the scripture itself declares that our creator does not change. Somebody is lying to you, and you're going to see the lies as they are being exposed to you, even as we speak.
Now what you are currently looking at is the creator's name on the ancient stone that's listed at the bottom. As you can see right here, this is the Aoudiath language that's read from right to left that we just went over earlier in the video. And as you can see right here, these four characters has the name of our creator known as the yod -Hey, vav -Hey, or the yod -Hey, -Hey in our language. Now, Judaism calls this something else. They call the name and pronounce the name Yahweh. Now, I've done an actual video covering the pronunciation of our Creator's name, and our Creator's name is pronounced Yahua, Yahua, Yahua. Now, here is the same chart of the 22 letters of the ancient Yaudiath language that I just showed you earlier. Now, the name of our creator, you get four characters, which is the Yod right here. So, this is the first letter, the Ha, the U, and then the Ha once again to get Yahua, so it's all vowels. In case you've never seen this before, this is how the name actually looks today. As you can see, it's pronounced Yahua. This is the ancient pictograph Hebrew, which is even older than the Paleo Hebrew. But this is how it looks in the Paleo Hebrew. You have the Yod He and then the U He right here, as we just went over. And then this is how it looks in the modern Hebrew today with the Yod He U He right there. And they say that this is pronounced as a V or W, but actually it's pronounced as an U, the U sound because the letter W is only a few thousand years old and I've gone over this in another video also which I will also link in the description box also and then in a Greek this is how it looks too because remember it's read from right to left but this is the restored name of our creator and you'll also see this name documented in ancient text also now this is an actual post from my blog and as you can see right here this is the name of the creator Yahua read from right to left so this is the Yod, this is the He, this is the U, and this is the He right here and then this is the name of our Messiah Yahusha as you can see this is the Yod, this is the He, this is the U, this is the Shin or the Shan right here and this is the Ayan and this is how it looks in the Paleo Hebrew right here the name of the Messiah. Now you start to notice a similarity in a pattern here between the name of our Father and the name of the Messiah. You see that they both have Yah or Yahu in their names right here. You can see it right here with the Yod and the He and the U, which sounds like Yahu, Yahu, Yahu. And this is why the language is so important. This is why language matters because even the Messiah himself says in Yahukanan or what you call Yahya, the book of John chapter 5 verse 43 where it says, I come in my father's name and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, him you would receive. Well, the Messiah's name Yahusha comes in his father's name Yahua because it has the Yah and the Yahu right here. Here, as you see but you also see that others have come in their own name like Isa or Jesus well guess what that's not the name of the Messiah and I've also done an in-depth video on Jesus also exposing that that's not the name of the Messiah and actually means earth pig and the name of the Messiah cannot be Esau because, once again, he's Hebrew, so therefore he has a Hebrew name. And same with our father, Yahuwah. Lord and God are not names. Those are titles. So therefore, they cannot be names of our Creator. And the same is true with Allah. That is a title, which means God. It is not a name. There is also archaeological evidence to prove the name Yahua and to prove that the prophets of old, commonly known as Moses, Abraham, and during their time, and even David also in the Psalms, that they all called on the name Yahua and that it was written in the Paleo Hebrew. And if you don't believe me, here is the archaeological proof, because right here we have the Meshach Stel, which is commonly known as the Moabite Stone. As you can see right here, the letters are very similar and written to what? The Paleo-Hebrew, as you see. But if you go to line 18, you actually see the name of our creator right here, Yahua, right there, the same four characters that we pointed out earlier ago. And line 18, you actually see the name right here.
here is a zoom in of the stone right here as you can see you see it says yahua right here this is a close-up of the stone on line 18 the name right there and i'll be sure to link all of this in the description box below so you can also take a look at it and see the truth for yourself that's right in front of you Another piece of archaeological text that you're looking at comes from the silver stones. Now these stones were written around the time of 625 BCE or 625 years before the Messiah, also before Babylonian captivity. Now the reason this scroll is so important is because the silver scrolls contain the book of Numbers chapter 6 verses 24 through 26. So this is what Masha or what you know as Musa or Moses would have written down during that time. And if you keep scrolling on the silver scrolls, what do you see? You actually see evidence of the name Yahua being used once, twice, three times right here. You see the name Yahua. And once again, this is quoting from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. This means that the name given on Mount Sinai, the name given to Musa or Masha Moses was in fact Yahua, as I've just shown you and even proven archaeologically speaking, but there's nowhere archaeologically to prove that Moses called on Allah or even Lord or God because those are not names, those are titles, and those are not in the Hebrew languages, but rather they're in the Arabic and English languages, languages that did not exist during that time. And once again, languages and names are so important, just like you would not like it if I called you out of your name or called you something that's not your name. The same is true with our creator, but yet religion has told you that it's all right to call on a different name other than the name of our creator, even though this is not true. And also, like scripture tells us, test the spirits, test it and see for yourself. Call on Allah and call on Yahua and just try it and see which one you get a response from and see the truth for yourself and same if you're still calling on l-o-r-d or g-o-d well now call on yahua test these spirits and see the truth for yourself and break out of these lies and deceptions more evidence that the name of our creator was used in ancient text as you see right here this is called the lakish letters and this comes from the 7th century bce so 700 years before our messiah arrived on the earth and this is of course before babylonian captivity once again you see the paleo hebrew language right here read from right to left and you see the name of our creator right here yahua 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 right there in the letters of lakish you also see a little bit of it right here too yahua this is from the Astrakhan of the house of Yahua that comes from the second half of the 7th century. And as you can see in this archaeological text right here, the name of our creator that's also used right here, read from right to left, also known as Yahua right here. And I'll be sure to link this in the description box below. But once again, this is more evidence showing you the name of our creator. And this is letter 18 from Arad that comes from the end of the 7th century. And you can see the name right there, although a little bit of it is blurred out. But if you actually look very closely, you can see the name, the Yod, the He, the U, and the He right here, written right there. And not only do you see the name being used thousands and thousands of years ago during the time of Dawood or even King David, but you also see the name even being used in the Dead Sea Scrolls which was a series of Aramaic text. And as you can see right here, you see the Aramaic language that's written that's very similar to the modern Hebrew, but you also see the name of our creator and see how it's in the Paleo Hebrew, the yod Hey and the u Hey that's written right there. But there is no archeological evidence of anyone in scripture calling on A-L-L-A-H or anyone using that word. There is no archeological evidence whatsoever, but there is archeological evidence of what's commonly known as the Tetragrammaton, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, the Paleo-Hebrew of the name of our creator.
And even in the Septuagint also, and mind you, all of these texts that I'm showing you, all of these texts, they predate the Quran by hundreds, if not thousands of years. And in all of them, once again, you see the name of our creator right here. And notice how the rest of this text is in Greek, but the name right here is in the Paleo-Hebrew because our creator has a Paleo-Hebrew name, just like we've gone over earlier ago. And here is more proof and evidence to support that. You even see the name even used too right here. You even see it used by Dawood or who you call David in the book of Zabur, which is commonly known as Psalms. And this is according to scripture because Zabur, which is commonly known as Psalms, is considered scripture even in the Quran from an Islamic perspective. Here is more evidence of the name Yahua that's being used from ancient texts, as you can see right here, and not Allah, because they've hidden this from you. They do not want you to know the name of your creator, but now the truth is finally being revealed to you after how many thousands and thousands of years. As you can see right here from the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a 2,000-year-old text of Psalms, the Book of Zabur. And by the way, this text predates the Quran by at least 500 years. As you can see, this was written even before the Messiah. You see the name of our creator right here, Yahuwah. You see it at least seven different times. You see one right here. You see another one right there. One right here. One right here with the yod Hey and the u Hey. And notice how it's still in the Paleo-Hebrew, even despite being in the Aramaic right there. You see the name right here, another time right here, and then another time right there. So you see that careful examination of this text will show our creator's name, Yahua, appearing seven times in this short amount of scripture. And yes, this is scripture even according to the Quran, even according to Islam itself. And this is the scripture that our Messiah would have read from. So you mean to tell me if David himself used this name in the book of Zabur, the book of Psalms, if the prophet David, according to you, used this word and did not even use Allah because there is no archaeological evidence of that, then how can the name of our creator be Allah when I just proven to you, archaeologically speaking, the name of our creator even being used right here in the book of Psalms? Here is another psalm scroll right here that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. As you look at it, you see real closely that it's written in the Aramaic, but you can see the restored name that's even written in the Paleo-Hebrew right there. You even see it right here too. You see no evidence of A-L-L-A-H, no evidence of L-O-R-D, no evidence of G-O-D. You even see it right here if you look really, really closely. I know it's kind of hard to see, but you even see it right here. And again, this is from the book of Zabur also known as the book of Psalms and it has 18 verses in this one if you actually look at the text right here you see it in verses 4 verse 6 verse 7 right there also and then if you go over here you see it in verse 11 verse 13 and verse 16 and like I said I'll link it in the description box so you also can take a look at it and be deceived no more and right here, this is Psalms chapter 145, once again showing you the restored name that's being used. Well, if our creator has a Hebrew name, and if our Messiah has a Hebrew name too, that means that all of the people and all of the prophets of scripture, they too have Hebrew names too. And in fact, this clay bulla used for sealing ancient scrolls actually belonged to Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah's personal scribe, Baruch. And you actually see his name right here, Barak Yahu. You see the Yahu right there, even more proof of it. Now, in case you did not know the names of the people in scripture, well, here are their actual names. And you even see the similarities with Arabic names, too, which we're going to be going over also. But as you can see right here, the name Isaiah, his real name is Yasha Yahu, and even Jeremiah Yah, Yaram Yahu, and Yahu Kazakal right here. You even see it there, Obadiah Yah, Obad Yahu, and also, too, Zephaniah, Tsapan Yahu, and even 
Zechariah here too, which is what Zakar Yahu Yahuwah remembers. And this is the reason why names are so important because their real names have meaning to them. So for example, with Zakar Yahu, it means Yahuwah remembers. With the name Sapan Yahu, it means that the secret is of Yahuwah. With the name Isaiah or Yasha Yahu, it means salvation is Yahua. That's what these names really mean, and it has to do with our Creator. And you even see something very similar to this even in Islamic names and Arabic names also. And even Psalms chapter 68 verses 4, because the book of Psalms or Zabur, as it's commonly known in Arabic, that's even considered scripture according to the Quran, but it even tells you, sing unto the Almighty, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the Shamayim or the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. Now the KJV has it as a J, but as I've gone over before, the letter J is only 500 years later and was actually Actually pronounced as a letter Y, just like in the name Khadijah is pronounced with the letter Y, Yah. Yah is the name. Why is this so important? Because we see if my people who are called by my name, so those who are called by the name of our creator Yahua, they have Yah, Yahu in our names. But you see the same type of similarities even in Arab names too. And they've tried to hide this from you for so long, but now you're seeing the truth with both your eyes open. Because you see, once again, the similarities even in the Quran who are considered prophets. For example, the one who's commonly known as Aaron is Harun in Arabic, or also known as Aarun in the Yaudiath Hebrew language, same for Yaqub which is Jacob in the English, it has the exact same pronunciation in the ancient Yaudiath Hebrew tongue, Yaqub. And then if you keep going right here, Yahya, which means Yahua lives, this is for John. Well, guess what? John, Yahya, you have Ya in your name twice, actually. And then also, if you keep going and keep scrolling, also Zechariah or Zechariah, notice the Yah right here in Zechariah. Notice the Yah right there, Zechariah, Zechariah. Yah is in his name, even in the Arabic too. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at the name Yahya, which is a common male name in Arabic, you actually see how this name is attributed to Yahukanan because that's his name in the Yahudith Hebrew language, also known as John the Baptist. But you see, Yahya means Yahua lives. So the name and the word Yahya means Yahua lives because the word life in Hebrew is Kaya, Kaya. Kaya, so when you put ya in front of it, ya ya instead of kaya, then you get yaua lives. Do you see how it's the same similarities? More similarities also include Job and Ayu because Ayub is how you would say his name in the Yaudiath Hebrew language as well as in Arabic. We've already gone over Yah Yah. You see the Yah right there, the name of our creator, the shortened version of Yahua, which means Yahua lives. And even same for Maryam too, it's the exact same pronunciation in Arabic and also in the Yaudiath language, very similar indeed. And you even see Ya all over Arabic names too, just like in the common one, Khadija, which is a female name and also known as the wife of Muhammad. And later on in this video, I'm gonna tell you the truth about the cover up when it comes to Muhammad's wife and what she was really about. But you even see the Ya right here, Khadija, Ya, kad ya, as it will be pronounced in the Yaudith Hebrew language. And it's just interesting, the first part right here, which is kad, the word kad actually means one in the Yaudith or the Hebrew language. So when you put the kad and the ya together to get the name Khadijah, where her name originates from, it actually means one ya, or that Yahua is one. Another thing that I wanted to point out also is the word Kadad too, because you see the Kad right there, but note how it's what? One of the descendants of Ishmael right here. You see Kadad, and if you actually go to it and click it, and I'll give it a chance to load from Strong's H2301, 
you see the masculine form of Cod right there, which was a son of Ishmael. And this is also the same root that's used in Khadijah's name. Now there is a place in scripture where you see the Cod once again, but now it's actually used for a female name right here. And it's in Strong's H2321, an ancient text that precedes a thousand years at least. And you can see that this is a Yasharalium or an Israelite woman right here found from 1 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 9. And her name is Kadash in the restored pronunciation, the same Cod as Khadijah. And if you actually look at this word total right here, Kadash, actually means made apart or what's commonly known as holy in English. Another common name also is Yaliel or Jaliel as it might be pronounced also. But as you can see right here, this name is also from the scriptures and also derives from the ancient Yaudiath. Now in the ancient Yaudiath, it would be pronounced Yakal Al, which means that all waits. But see, just like with Khadijah, Khadijah, just like with this one, Yalil, Yalil, you hear the Ya, the Ya, ooh? Now in the Arabic, it will be pronounced Ja because this is a Jim right here, this is an Alif, and this is a Ha right there. And as you can see, this is how it would be pronounced. But in the Yaudia through the ancient Hebrew, it would actually be pronounced Ya. But if you keep going, you see the similar names. And it's just so interesting how even one of the names with Ya in it has another name. But we know the name of our creator, which is Yahua, because it derives from Yahua, Ya, Yahu, just like we read in the book of Psalms also, going back to the book of Zabur, the book of Psalms, you even see the phrase praise Yah all throughout it, just like Psalm 68, verse 4. Well, what is the highest praise? Hallelujah, hallelujah means in the English, praise be unto Yah. And it's just interesting because the word halal is also an Arabic word and is a very common Arabic word, but it originates from the Hebrew, which means to praise. But you even see and hear the Ya all throughout Arabic words and Arabic countries too, because just like for Morocco, you have Al Mamlaka, Al Maghribiya, and you can see it right here in the Arabic too. You see the Ya right there, and this is right here if you look in the Arabic because it's read from right to left. Here is the Ya right here. This right here is the Ya, the letter itself, the last letter of the Arabic alphabet, and then this right here is the marbuta which is two dots above the ha which makes the ya sound and morocco's not the only one you even see it with jordan too you see the similarities because the official name of jordan in arabic is al mamlaka al ordunia al hashimia so you see right here with ordunia there's the ya right there the same exact thing that you see even with morocco and then you see it again right here with hashimia right here these two letters right there as you can see highlighted the same is true with Saudi Arabia because you see the Ya right there even twice again because all Mamlaka, so the kingdom of all Arabiya, Asadiya, you see the Ya right there once again. And the purpose of my going over this is so that you can see for yourself Ya, Ya'u even being used in common modern standard Arabic because even in the official name for Algeria known as the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria, you get what? You see the ya in the pronunciations once again, even right here. You see the commonalities and the similarities? The same is even true for Libya also because with Libya they even show you in the English too Libya, Labya. Interestingly enough in the ancient Hebrew that would actually mean the heart of Yah but you can even see it right here and unlike a Ha this time or a Marbuta at the end of the letter you actually have a Ya and then an Alif right here and the same is true for Nigeria and Indonesia also in the Arabic language. You even see the ya or the ia suffix in many common Arabic words and other words that are used to form abstract nouns from other nouns, such as the word importance, ahami ya, and also the word rifle, which is bunduki ya.
other one too is a ya right in front of you because the word a ya also has it with the ya and then also right here marbuta and it just so happens to mean evidence or sign or miracle and can also be used for the word verse well a miracle is happening indeed and that miracle is you're learning and now you know the true restored name of our creator yahua and his son yahusha please understand also that this is not a religion but rather this is having a relationship with our creator using the restored name and just like we have relationships with our family members just like we have relationships with our friends just like we have relationships with our children and even just like we have relationship with our pets and other people who we see the first thing that we know is their names and there is nothing religious about that but just like we have relationships with everyone else the first thing we need to know is their names and the same goes for our creator yahua through our messiah yahusha and no, this is not a religion, this is not Christianity, this is not Judaism, but rather this is an invitation to get to know our true creator, Yahua, because Yahua wants to have a real special intimate relationship with you and is opening up your heart and mind to have that real special relationship, but you have to accept it and be willing to have a relationship with the one who made you by getting to know his true name, Yahua. But did Muhammad know the true name of our Creator? Because here we are in the Quran from Surah 2, Ayah 163, right here, where it says right here the word him. We're actually going to briefly look at this because when it's pronounced out loud, what sound does it make? Hua. 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 Did you hear that? Because it has the ha right here, but it has a duma over it. So that makes the u sound with the h, so hu. And then this is the wa right here in the Arabic, which is a vowel. And it has right here the fatah right above it. So it makes the a sound, so huwa. Huwa. And it says him in this passage right here, this verse is reminiscent to what? Just like the words of Masha or what you know as Musa, Moses, Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says, here, O oh Yasharal, Yahua our Alua is one. Yahua is one. Now, this is how the Tetragrammaton, the name of our Creator, restored, as we've just proven with the Yahudith Hebrew language and ancient texts that predates Arabic and Islam by how many centuries, actually, if not thousands of years. But this is how it would look in the Arabic language, as you can see right here with the four letters the Ya right there, and then also the Ha the wall and then the ha again now going back to the ancient pronunciation and the way to pronounce things anciently speaking of course if you put this in google translate the same four different characters right here this is what would pop up but of course we know that the letter j did not exist back then it's only 400 years old so how can jc be the name of the messiah but anyway then it has a v right here but if you actually go back it makes the oo sound because the letter v comes from the letter U, and like I said, I've done a video covering this more in great detail. But if you actually pronounce this out, this right here is the Ya, so it makes the Ya sound, the Y. This right here is the Ha, which is the H. This right here is the Wa, or the W, but we know that the W, just pronounce that out in English, it sounds like double U, or the U, and then here's the Ha once again, so you get Ya Ua, Ya Ua, Ya -ua. Ua, even right here in the Arabic. that I've archaeologically proven to you and have shown you the truth about the name of our Creator and even shown you with Scripture itself and archaeologically speaking the name of our Creator and how it's Yahua with Scripture itself and nowhere do you see Arabic being used or spoken and like I said earlier when it comes to names if we know that the Creator has a Hebrew name and all of the people of old in Scripture including Moses or what they call Musa 
and even Dawood, if they called on Yahua, and there's archaeological proof to prove this, but then thousands of years down the line, all of a sudden, the word A-L-L-A-H just so happens to come up from Muhammad, and now this is the supposed name of the Creator, and now all of a sudden it changes. Our Creator does not change. Somebody is lying to you. I care more about your deliverance and salvation than I do your feelings, because the truth is the origin of the word Allah comes from the compound Arabic word al ila and as you can see right here in the Arabic, you see right here, it has the Alif and then the Lam, the Ha, and then the Marbuta right there, and it means, and it's a term that's a title that means G-O-D. And there are Western and non-Western and even Islamic sources to prove the origins of Allah and that it just means God, G-O-D. It's an Arabic word. It is a title. It is not a name, just like we went over with the doctor example. If you go by the title Dr. Khan, doctor is not your name. That is a title, just like with this. It is the definite article, the, and the Elah is an Arabic word for G-O-D. It is not a proper name nor is it the name of our creator but a generic name a title just like the Hebrew L or all it is a title not a name and there are even sources that proves this too because the encyclopedia of religion says that it is a pre-islamic name or a title corresponding to the Babylonian bell and this is according to the encyclopedia of religion and I know this might be difficult to accept but the truth is right in front of you and this is the real truth and the truth will make you free and knowing the name of our creator the restored name will make you free indeed because they've hidden it from so long from you they don't want you to know the name until now and even the encyclopedia britannica also tells you the same thing that allah is found in arabic inscriptions prior to islam and even according to the encyclopedia of islam itself the Arabs before the time of Muhammad accepted and worshipped after a fashion the deity called A-L-L-A-H and according to the Encyclopedia of Islam also it was known to pre-Islamic Arabs one of the Meccan deities and we're going to be going over that and I'm going to show you the real archaeological evidence later on in the video to come but it also shows how it was used in pre-islamic poetry so you see how it was pre-islamic and used even before the time of muhammad even hundreds of years before and even according to the encyclopedia of religion and ethics it even says the origin of it goes back to pre-muslim times and they even tell you also that it is not a common name whatsoever and again, this is based on scholarly evidence indeed, because it even shows here that based on scholar Henry Preserve Smith of Harvard University, this says it was already known by name to the Arabs before Islam even was a religion. And based on the findings of Dr. Kenneth Cragg, who was a former editor of the prestigious scholarly journal Muslim World and an outstanding modern Western Islamic scholar whose works were generally published by Oxford University, also commented in the call of the Manoret, where it says the name was also evident in archaeological and literary remains of pre-Islamic Arabia. What this means is that this is not the name of our creator. Dr. W. Montgomery Watt, who was a professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Edinburgh University and visiting professor of Islamic studies at College de France, Georgetown University, has also done some work on the pre-Islamic concept and has also said the exact same things in Mohammed's Mecca and also the Journal of Scientific Semitic Studies. Caesar Farah in his book on Islam also concludes the same thing of the pre-Islamic meaning of what this word actually is, Allah, A-L-L-A-H, and also according to Middle East scholar E.M. Wary, whose translation of the Quran is still used today, has also noted even Allah being worshipped during the time pre-Arabia and even pre-Islam as pre-Arabian deities, the worship of Baal. This has nothing to do with the worship of 
our creator because like I've just proven earlier again, none of the prophets in scripture called on this name. None of them did because it's a title and the language Arabic did not exist back then. So how could they call on an Arabic title when that language did not exist in the pre-scriptural times? But it even says here in ancient Arabia, the sun god was viewed as a female deity and the moon as a male deity. As has been pointed out by many scholars such as Alfred, the moon deity was called by various names, one of which was in fact Allah. Again, this is truth. And like I said, call upon the names yourself. Call upon Yahuwah, the true name of our creator, and Allah, and you'll see the difference. I'm telling you this is true, that I'm only calling upon these words in this video for educational purposes. But it says here that it was used as the personal name of the moon deity in addition to the other titles that could be given and ascribed to. And also, isn't it true too that in Islam there are 99 different names of G-O-D? How can that be when according to scripture itself, our creator only has one name? Do you see how they've hidden everything? And also there were three deities that were also produced from this and one of them was called Allah right there as you can see, which sounds very familiar to Allah. Do you see how all of this has been hidden from you? They don't want you to know the truth, but the truth is being restored and revealed to you today. But it goes even much deeper than that because when you call on that word or if you refer to that word for our creator, what you're actually doing is you're cursing and you're swearing because that same word is actually in the Yaudiyat, the Hebrew language, and it means to swear, to curse. So if Ibrahim, who is commonly known as Abraham, or if Musa, who is commonly known as Moses, if they called on this title, they would actually be cursing the name of our creator. And we know that they did not do this because according to the writings of the Torah or what you know as the Tarot, well, guess what? The third commandment is what? Not to take the name of our creator in vain. But that is exactly what you are doing if you continue to call on this title. And same with L-O-R-D, same with G-O-D. They are all breaking the third commandment. Because calling on such a word means to curse, and that is a no-no, of course. And now we've just proven to you the restored name of our Creator, which is in fact Yahuwah for the Father right here, read from right to left, and Yahusha right here, read from right to left, which is the Son. And we'll also be talking more about this in the spiritual side of this, in the spiritual component, so you can see the true origins and where this comes from and who has hidden all of this from you and who has conspired to keep this hidden from you for so long. Here you can also see the name of our creator read from right to left, Yahua, as you can see. But if you actually look at the word Judah, it actually means Yahuda, Yahuda. It just has the doll or the dalit right here. If you take that out, you get the name Yahua, and this is the Paleo Hebrew for our Messiah, Yahusha, not Esau, not Jesus. And that is what we are doing today. We are exposing all of these deceptions because just as we've proven all of the prophets of old, they called on the name of Yahuwah. But what has happened? The Kadash or the made apart name of the Father has been removed from most translations of your scriptures and replaced with names such as L-O-R-D and G-O-D replaced with titles that are not names to maintain a tradition. And we know we are not to follow Jewish fables and traditions or any of the traditions of man because that's what the Messiah rebuked and came against. But that is exactly what Christianity is doing when they call on L-O-R-D or G-O-D. And the same is true with the Quran and in Islam with A-L-L-A-H because they are not names and it's so important to know the name of our creator indeed. And also, remember the words of the Torah or the Thura, the Torah that was given to Musa, commonly known as Moses, Masha, in the Yaudiyat Hebrew tongue. Because in the book of Debarium, Deuteronomy chapter 13 even tells you that if there is a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, what is the Creator doing? Testing you to see if you're going to follow the law, statutes, and commandments and call upon the name of our Creator. Or if that prophet is going to lead you astray, calling on names of idols just like Muhammad. And later on in the video, I'm going to share with you the truth about Muhammad also. And who Muhammad really saw.
But again, test these spirits to see for yourself what is true. Forget about everything you've been taught and test these spirits just like the scripture tells us and you will see the truth for yourself. Just try it. Do not believe a word I'm saying, but just try it. Call upon the name Yahuwah. Call upon the name Yahusha and you too will see the truth for yourself because the truth will make you free and the truth is finally being revealed and restored to you after all these years of attempting to hide. Now that we have gone over the cultural side of Islam and also showed you the cultural aspects and also the similarities between the Arabic and the Yaudith Hebrew language, now we're also going to uncover more truth and go over the historical side of Islam because there is a whole side that they're not showing you because what they want you to believe and what they want you to only know is that Muhammad received the dream and a vision from Gabriel and that's how the Quran came about. But there is more to the story there is way more to this and there's also more involvement that we will uncover that you will see even right now now there's that old saying that says all roads lead to rome and how true is this this is very true because the main culprit of all the religions that you see is the roman catholic church is the vatican also known as the beast of the book of revelation and even in the book of Daniel where it says the beast would think to change times and change laws, I'm going to expose that and show you how the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church has been doing this for centuries now, for thousands and thousands of years, and also share with you hidden history of how they infiltrated Islam and also helped in the creation and the spreading of Islam in order to attempt to keep the truth hidden from Arabs and from Muslims, but now the truth is being revealed to you today. I've gone over this more in my Mark of the Beast and Image of the Beast in a 666, the Mark of the Beast video, where I talked about the catechism of the Catholic Church and how they have changed and twisted commandments with no authority to do so whatsoever, because the word even says that whosoever adds and takes away from the word will receive all the plagues and the punishments that are written there. And I will briefly go over it once more because the beast system known as the Roman Catholic Church has done exactly that. And I'm going to expose to you in this video also more on the mark of the beast and how it also relates to Islam also. But that will be later on in this video. But the reason we're here at these catechisms from the Vatican's website is so you can see how the Vatican has changed the Sabbath seventh day of rest and how they changed it to Sunday, the first day of the week, Sunday sun worship. And they even tell you right here in 2190, the Sabbath, which represented the completion of the first creation, has now all of a sudden been replaced. Who gave them the authority to replace it to Sunday sun worship? The beast system known as the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, what else did they do? They also changed commandments and they changed the Ten Commandments because even here when it talks about the Ten Commandments, there is a commandment missing and the commandment missing is no graven images. Why did they take that one out? So that they can justify using the Virgin Mary statues and all of the statues of JC, all of which are abominable by the way. They took the second commandment out because you do not see that commandment here whatsoever. Instead of the Sabbath day being the fourth commandment, now it has become their third commandment according to them and they replaced it from the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day to Sunday. What else did they do? Under their authority, they took out the restored name of our creator, Yahua, and the restored name of our Messiah, Yahusha, and they replaced it with pagan titles such as L-O-R-D. And by the way, L-O-R-D in the Yaudith Hebrew language means Baal. So every time you call on L-O-R-D, you're actually calling on Baal and you do not even know it. Every time you call on G-O-D, well, G-O-D is actually the shortened version version of the name of Satan and you do not even know it. They've done all of these things, mixing and blending paganisms 
And then under their authority, which you're going to see, they then gave you the word A-L-L-A-H and told you that this is the name of our creator. Do you see how all of this has been twisted? But not only did they do that, adding and taking away when it comes to the names, they also then added another commandment right here where they added, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and that you shall not desire anything that is your neighbor. Do you see how they added these two commandments? Because it's actually just supposed to be one. More or adding and taking away. During the period of the 300s AD, so a few hundred years before Islam was founded as a religion, the Roman Catholic Church was already hard at work under the authority of Pope Constantine to create their religion known as Christianity and also blend paganisms and pass all types of creeds and acts and abominable councils such as the establishment of the Trinity and the reason that they did all of this is because they were blending Babylonian paganisms with the truth in order to convert people to their new religion known as Christianity and if you would like to learn more about this please take a look at my image of the beast and mark of the beast videos where I go into detail but then it wasn't until the 500s AD when the Roman Catholic Church took full force and then what they started to do for the course of 1260 years is that they started to implement their Roman Inquisition where if anyone did not listen to them and if anyone did not convert to Roman Catholicism these were the different torturing methods that were used. Here were medieval torture devices that were used by the Roman Catholic Church and I've gone over this before but I'm briefly going to go over it once again. This is a torture room that you see in the Inquisition Cathedral in Nuremberg, Germany. They also used torturing methods such as the rack and mind you this was for those who did not agree with the Roman Catholic heresies. They also used stocks also for torturing methods, water torture, the heretics fork right here as you can see, the pear, and many more. They also use torturing methods such as the branks and also the wheel and like I said I've gone over this more in some of my previous videos which I will be sure to link. But how do we know for sure that Rome and the Roman Catholic Church is in fact the beast of revelation? Because in 1798 is when the papal authority was captured by Napoleon and the Pope no longer ruled for a period of time, but it wasn't until 1929 following the later in Concordat that was signed as of February of 1929 that the heel had been wounded of many years. The deadly wound healed. Hello, where does that remind you of? That reminds us of the Apostle Yahya or John the Apostle in the book of Revelation chapter 13 that the beast's deadly wound would be healed and that came to pass with the establishment of the Vatican. And this is a headline from the San Francisco Chronicle back in 1929 that says heal wound of many years, the deadly wound. But now I'm going to show you how they also infiltrated Islam thousands of years ago before Islam even became a religion. Dr. Alberto Rivera, who was a former Jesuit priest, published a series of comics exposing religion and its true source and where they came from. And one of them that he published was entitled The Prophet, as you can see right here, by Chick Publications. And this was after his conversation with former Jesuit Cardinal Augustine B which chronicles and documents how the Roman Catholics wanted to take over Jerusalem at the end of the 3rd century AD, but it was not just Jerusalem that they wanted to take over. Once again, the truth is right in front of you, and we're going to be going over some of this so you can see with both your eyes open how the Roman Catholic Church has infiltrated Islam even before Islam became a religion and also you're going to see the family involvement too because yes Khadijah the wife of Muhammad also played a major role in this along with Robert Ka who was Khadijah's cousin and also too Fatima the daughter of Muhammad and Khadijah.
And so in the comic, Dr. Alberto Rivera is asked about the history of the Muslim faith and then says here, what I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican, the beast, as we just went over, when I was a Jesuit priest under oath in induction. A Jesuit cardinal named Augustine B. showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the third century because of its religious history and strategic strategic location, the holy city was considered a priceless treasure. A scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. The great untapped source of manpower that could do this job was the children of Ishmael. The poor Arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the powers of darkness and that plan you're going to see is being exposed right now. Dr. Alberto Rivera then goes on to give a brief historical background on the truth about the Messiah, the real Messiah whose name we do know as Yahusha, the restored name, who is in fact the creator in the flesh, and we'll be talking more about that later on, but then the actual article goes on to read more about the Roman history and how the statue of Jupiter in Rome was eventually called Saint Peter and the statue of Venus was then changed to the Virgin Mary. The site chosen for its headquarters was one of the seven hills which is also mentioned where the bee sits in the book of Revelation called Vaticanus, the place of divination and the place where the satanic temple of Janus stood. The great counterfeit religion was called Roman Catholicism. Yahusha, our Messiah, called it mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth through the prophet Yahya or John the Apostle as you know him she was raised up to block the great news and slaughter the true believers of the Mashiach whose name is Yahusha and establish religions create wars and make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornications as you will see in the following pages and how did they do this? Well, they used the creation of Islam and infiltrated Islam and the Arabs during that time, including Muhammad, Khadija, and Waraqwa, in order to do so. In fact, in 354 AD, a devout Roman Catholic mother gave birth to a son whose name was Augustine. Augustine was a genius and eventually became a quote-unquote saint in the Roman Catholic religion. He was the Bishop of Roman Africa. And then it also says Augustine is known for two works, the City of G.O.D. and Confessions, which, unknown to the Arab world, have greatly affected their lives for centuries. Augustine was busy winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism, including whole tribes, but multitudes of Arabs hated Catholicism and would not convert, so what did they have to do? In time, spies were then sent to those remote nomads who rejected Catholicism and spread the word that one day, and a great leader would appear who would gather the Arabs together. So 200 years following Augustine around 570 AD is when Muhammad was said to be born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, which would of course change the course of world history. But how did this religion actually come into existence? You're going to see the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now much of the world is only getting a limited scope of how Islam was actually founded by Muhammad because Islam claims that Abraham and Ishmael built the house of G.O.D. beside the well which saved the life of Ishmael and his mother Hagar. And this original house was of course called the Kaaba and we're going to be talking more about that later on in this video in the spiritual aspects of the Kaaba and also the Hajj pilgrimage and how this relates to the Kabbalah. The story goes on to talk about how in the beginning, visitors would bring gifts to this house and the keepers of the Kaaba were gracious to all who came. Some brought their idols and not wanting to offend the people, their idols were placed inside of the house. But then eventually, the people no longer had access to the well or Zamzam because the tribe guarding the sacred places was unjust. These people were from Yemen and were called Juhurmites who then gained control of Mecca, and then afterwards, the Kuzaites then took over, but they allowed the Moabite deity to be placed in the Kaaba and continued in the idolatry. And then the Kuzaites were then replaced by the Qurayash, who were a powerful tribe of Arabs who descended from the line of Ishmael. 
And then arose another man whose name was Abad al-Mutalib, who was the grandfather of Muhammad, who was given visions telling him where to find the well, who then eventually dug up the well and then gave birth to a son called Abdallah. According to Arab tradition, the grandfather of Muhammad then visited a woman for advice, and instead of offering up the son, a hundred camels were then killed, and his son was then spared, who became the dad of Muhammad. But meanwhile, it was the Roman Catholic Arabs who were pushing the concept of looking for an Arab prophet, just as during this time the false Jews were looking for their quote-unquote messiah. And this is the part of the history that's been hidden. Who but a prophet would be capable of ridding the Arabs of the worship of false deities? There was even an icon of the Virgin Mary and an icon of J.C. even in the Kaaba. Years later, Muhammad was then born, but then Muhammad even made this statement right here where Muhammad said, Satan touches every son of Adam the day his mother beareth him, save only Mary and her son. Why would Muhammad be pushing Roman Catholic teaching? Isn't this strange? Muhammad was then 25 years old when he married a wealthy widow named Khadija, who was about 40 years old at the time. Muhammad and Khadija then had two sons who died young and four daughters. The most famous was Fatima, who then married Muhammad's successor, his cousin Ali, as recognized by the Shia branch of Islam. It was around 610 AD where Muhammad claimed to have a vision from Allah of a majestic beam whom he called the messenger Gabriel. And we're going to be going over that so you're going to see who this really was. And from that time until the time of Muhammad's death, Muhammad continued to claim to receive messages. However, what you probably did not know about Warwakwa, who is the cousin of Khadijah, was actually Roman Catholic. And with the help of his wife's Roman Catholic's cousin, Warwakwa, Muhammad was able to interpret. And some of the revelations were then placed in the Quran in 650 AD. However, other writings of Muhammad were never published. And then it was in the fifth year of Muhammad's mission that persecution came against his followers because they refused to worship the idols in the Kaaba. Muhammad then instructed some of them to flee to Abyssinia. However, Nagus, the Roman Catholic king of Abyssinia, accepted them because of Muhammad's views on the Virgin Mary, which were so close to what? Roman Catholic doctrine. But history proves that before Islam even came into existence, the Sabians in Arabia worshipped the moon idol who was married to the sun idol. They then gave birth to three deities who were called Alat, Aluza, and Manat. They became idols and were worshipped throughout that world as daughters of Allah. And you can see the crescent moon symbol everywhere in Islam, even on flags all over the place. And in 1950, the moon deity was excavated at Hazor and Palestine. Palestine showing Allah sitting on the throne. Notice the crescent moon on the chest right there. It's only an idol. So what did the Vatican have to do during this time? The Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both the Yahudi those who keep the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahuwah and with the true belief of Yahusha, and they had to eliminate anyone who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. So, looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of manpower to do their dirty work. And by the time Augustine appeared on the scene, Augustine was already busy destroying scriptural manuscripts that were owned by the true people of the scriptures, the Yaudium, those keeping the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahua, along with the witness of Yahusha. And then also the Vatican wanted to create a Messiah for the Arabs, someone that they could raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma who they could train and eventually unite all the non-Catholic Arabs behind him, creating a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. And this is according to the Jesuits themselves. Now, according to the Jesuits, a wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the people played a tremendous part in this. Who was this? Khadijah. She had given her wealth to the mother church and retired to a convent. While there, she was given a strange assignment and then sent back to the world. 
And this is according to the Vatican, the beast itself. Her job, Khadijah, was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. That was her job. And what better one to use than someone who was illiterate? Because yes, Muhammad was in fact illiterate. And then it says here, Khadijah had a cousin named Waraka, who, like herself, was a very faithful Roman Catholic. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. The Vatican had him placed in a critical spot as Muhammad's advisor. So what happened? Then Muhammad and Khadijah then married, and Rome had found their man, Muhammad, and money was no object. Teachers were then sent to young Muhammad, and Muhammad underwent intensive training under the Roman Catholic authorities. Muhammad devoured the works of St. Augustine under Rawakah's teaching and became a devotee of the works, preparing him for his, quote, great calling. Satan was determined to block the great news of Yahusha Amashayak, Yahusha, the true name of our Messiah, from reaching the children of Ishmael. So, by using the Vatican, the B system, Satan closed the door for centuries, depriving the Arabs from hearing about the light of the world and by creating Islam in order to do so. Under orders from the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Arabs across North Africa began spreading the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and be the chosen one of their deity. While Muhammad was being groomed, he was then told that his enemies were the Yaudium, those who truly possessed the belief of Yahusha and keeping the commandments of Yahua during that time, the commandments that were given to Musa, Moses. He was also told that the Roman Catholics were the only true ones and that the others calling themselves the true people were actually wicked imposters and the children of the devil who should be destroyed. Do you see how the Roman Catholic Church infiltrated and spread lies? This satanic teaching is believed today in the minds of Muslims worldwide and destroys the efforts of reaching them for Mashiach Yahusha in every Muslim nation until today because you're seeing the truth being revealed. While Muhammad began receiving quote-unquote revelations in a cave at Mount Hira, not far from the outskirts of Mecca, Rabakwa, the Roman Catholic cousin of Muhammad's wife, became deeply involved interpreting the visions given to Muhammad, and eventually out of this came forth the quote-unquote holy book of Islam called the Quran, which contains much of Muhammad's writings. Interestingly enough, though, from an early stage, Muslims received protection from Catholic kings because of Muhammad's revelation concerning the Virgin Mary. But there still remain unpublished works of Muhammad. They are now in the hands of high-ranking men in the Islamic faith. When Cardinal B shared this with us in the Vatican, he said that these writings are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. Both sides have so much information on each other that if exposed, it would create such a scandal. It would cause a major disaster for both religions. Why? Because they do not want you to know these things. They do not want you to know how the Roman Catholic Church has infiltrated Islam, and you're going to see some similarities and commonalities between both Islam and the Roman Catholic Church, such as the usage of beads, such as Fatima, and the list goes on. And following the death of Muhammad, the Pope moved quickly and issued bulls granting the Arab generals permission to invade and conquer the nations of North Africa. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three special favors. One, eliminate the true believers, those keeping the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahua and the belief of Yahusha. Two, protect the Augustinian monks and Roman Catholics. And three, conquer Jerusalem for, quote unquote, his holiness in the Vatican. The conquest of North Africa was underway, and this is how Islam spread throughout much of North Africa. Interestingly enough, also, Roman Catholics were never attacked, nor were their shrines during this time.
And during much bloodshed, there were even more lies that were promoted and purported because under Raraka's direction, Muhammad had written in the Quran the great lie that Abraham offered Ishmael as an offering, even though scripture tells you that it was Isaac who was the offering, but Muhammad removed Isaac's name and inserted Ishmael, adding and taking away. As a result of this in Muhammad's vision, the Muslims then built the mosque known as the Dome of the Rock, of course, causing even more war and more bloodshed during this time. And the wars continued on for centuries and centuries even after this. And all of this resulted in the killing and the slaughter of hundreds of millions of people years after Islam had been founded for a course of about a thousand years. And as I've talked about in previous videos before, the number one religion responsible for all of these deaths actually is not Islam, but is in fact Christianity, Roman Catholicism, because yes, they're the exact same thing. And I've talked about that and proven that also. But with Mecca and the Vatican fully at peace together, the old whore of Revelation 17 and 18, known as the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, got her Jesuits busy again plotting and hatching schemes to try to now control Islam. And how did they do that? With the pushing and the promotion of Fatima through the Virgin Mary. And note the similarities there by the time of the early 1900s. Then, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V wrote Dum Diversas, which granted to the kings of Spain and Portugal the right to reduce any Saracens or Muslims and pagans and any other unbelievers to what they call perpetual slavery, which is where you get all of the abominable torturing methods of the Roman Catholic Church during the period of the Inquisition. But the Arab world is no strangers when it comes to this because with the help of the Roman Catholic Church also funding with the Arabs the Arab slave trade, that is how slavery was able to flourish in the Arab world due to the slave trade and the slaughtering of the true people of the scriptures because yes, according to scriptural prophecy, so-called black people are in fact the people of the scriptures. And due to the Arab slave trade, these so-called blacks were transported all over the world, even as places as far east as India, and even places as far north, to what's commonly known as the Middle East. And yes, it's true also, according to the words of the Hadith, Muhammad was white and even owned slaves himself, and even the Quran promotes and encourages slavery also. with slave auctions that still take place today even in places such as Libya, not to mention undercover torturings, beatings, castrations, and etc. that still happen and occur in the prisons along with gang rape, sex trafficking, human trafficking, and prostitution, but it's also under the hand of the Vatican and the Jesuits who are also pushing this and conspiring with the Arabs. And now I'm going to show you even more how Islam has been mingled with the Roman Vatican and the Roman Catholicism and you're going to see stark similarities because here you're looking at a picture of what's commonly known as Al-Barak. And this is the mythical horse that Muhammad is said to ride upon up to the Shamayim or the heavens. But what is this really reminiscent of? You see how this looks like a woman on a beast? The woman riding the beast? Do you see this? Just like on this coin from 1825, this is an 1825 coin of a pope that depicts and shows a woman ruling the world. But what does it also show? It shows that same woman where Islam emerged riding a beast. The woman riding a beast, just like right here, the woman on a beast. Do you see how similar they are? This goes all the way back to Babylon. This goes all the way back to Rome. And just like the statue of Daniel or Daniel chapter 2 representing the different kingdoms, we know that the first one represents the head, represents Babylon. Then we have Medo-Persian Empire that represents the silver, the gold representing Babylon, the brass representing Greece, and then the iron representing Rome right here, the legs. But notice how there are two legs right here. And then at the very bottom, you have the iron and the clay that represents the mixing and the mingling of the two.
And it's just interesting because when you actually look at what the word Arab means in the Yaudi, the Hebrew language, it actually means Arab. What does it mean? To mix, the mixing, the combining. So when you actually look at Daniel chapter 2, the iron mixed with clay, what does that represent? Rome mixed with the Arabs. Christianity mixed with Islam. Do you see how this is all blended together? Roman Catholicism mixed with Islam and blended together. And this prophecy is not only coming to pass spiritually, but it's also politically and economically speaking with the control of oil, control of labor, and also religiously with the beast Vatican Rome mixing and blending Catholicism influences all over Islam, not to mention the church government, the whore of Babylon. Do you see this at the European Union building the woman riding a beast? Do you see how the EU Parliament building is reminiscent of the Tower of Babel, which represents Rome, by the way? And even on the Euro coin, there is also a woman riding the beast, just like with Al Barak. You see a woman on the beast. Do you see the similarities here? Rome and Arabs mixing together. And then right after that, the rock, who represents Yahusha, crashes down on these reins. And what's also very interesting and suspicious indeed to note also is that on the Catholic University of America in this picture that's taken, notice how they're all adorned with what? Scarlet and purple, just like the colors of what? The Book of Revelation of the Beast. But do you see the moon symbol right here that's also depicted? This moon symbol right here, what? Represents and denotes Islam, which also explains why the Pope is attempting to merge with Islam to form their one world religion that's why your pope is making ridiculous and abominable statements by trying to say and suggest that the quran and the scriptures are the same and once again you see the moon right here that's even being promoted by roman catholicism the blending and the merging of both catholicism christianity and islam together and even the book of kazun revelation chapter 18 verse 19 where Yahya, or John the Apostle, who's also known as Yahukanan in the restored name, says, And they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and mourning, and saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she was laid waste. Now what this is talking about, we know that that great city represents Rome, and the sea became rich by her wealth. Well, it also talks about the ships. Well, when you look at the ships, this represents what? The transatlantic slave trade, and also the Arab slave trade. Who were the main ones involved in the woman and the trading of Revelation 18:19 when it comes to ships? The Pope and Vatican with the transatlantic slave trade, along with who? The Arabs and the Arab slave trade, the mixing and the mingling. The two legs right here representing the mixing and the mingling represent both Rome and the Arabs together. But now that you see the Vatican and the Roman Catholicism involvement in this and the scheme and scam of spreading Islam and purposely using Muhammad to do so via the family, via Khadijah, his wife, and Rarakwa, the cousin of Khadijah, along with the creation of denominations, and if you unscramble that, you get I, demon, nation, very interesting and suspicious indeed, and not just when it comes to Christianity with the 33,000 plus denominations, but also with Islam between Shia and Sunni Muslims. Do you see what they're doing? Divide and conquer. It has to do with Rome all over again and trying to spread and spark war between the differences in the two. But what about Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad? How does Fatima play a role in this deception too? Because you're going to see that Fatima is involved with this too, blending and merging with Roman Catholicism and the Virgin Mary, Isis, Semiramis worship.
And this is a quote from the late Bishop Sheen, who said this about the Virgin Mary in Islam, quote, Our Lady's appearance at Fatima marked the turning point in the history of the world's then 347 million Muslims, the most difficult of all religious people to convert to Roman Catholicism. The Muslims occupied Portugal for centuries and have left their mark. After the death of his daughter Fatima, Muhammad wrote of her that she is, quote, the most holy of all women in paradise next to Mary. Now this comes from the prophet, which we just read earlier. Now, while it is true that the Messiah, the true Messiah, Yahusha, was in fact born of a virgin, what the Roman Catholicism decided to do is use that and decided to use Fatima, infiltrate Islam through Fatima, which is Muhammad's daughter, in order to turn all attention to Fatima with the hand of Fatima and away from the great news of the scripture and away from Yahusha, the true Messiah. So in the 1910s, they needed the Virgin Mary to appear in order to infiltrate and control Islam and use Fatima in order to do so. The Jesuits also wanted Russia involved in the location of this vision at Fatima played a key role in pulling Islam to the quote mother church, which is Roman Catholicism, all of it built and based on a lie. And it wasn't until 1917 that the Virgin appeared in Fatima which was the main spark of World War I in Russia in order to try to get Russia to convert to Roman Catholicism. And the Jesuits invented the Novenas to Fatima, which they could perform throughout North Africa, spreading good public relations before the Islamic world. And of course, the poor Arabs thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad, but really are actually paying homage to who? The Virgin Mary, Isis worship. The wars continued on all the way up even until World War II, and in 1936, the new Spanish Inquisition exploded called the Spanish Civil War, secretly orchestrated in the Vatican by the Vatican. To keep the world from knowing the truth, it was made to look in the news like the Vatican was fighting the communists in a quote-unquote holy war, when they were in fact not. During the Spanish Inquisition, the Muslim troops were getting their revenge at last under the Pope, and then... After the Spanish Civil War, Spain was then in ruins, bleeding and beaten, but safely back in the hands of the Vatican. About four million Muslim troops occupied Spain as the protectors of the Roman Catholic faith. Islam had paid her debt to the Antichrist sitting in the Vatican, which also led to the spreading of Fatima. But nothing hasn't changed because also, according to the prophet, today the Pope is still desperately trying to gain control of Jerusalem. That goal has not changed. Jerusalem will soon fall into the hands of the Pope and the Muslim nations will be of assistance. The last Pope will be the Antichrist who knows he must flee to Jerusalem to escape from the Vatican just before it is destroyed. In the past, and even now, Satan has used religion to destroy billions of souls and is even attempting to do so now, which is why I'm doing this video exposing these religions, including Islam, so you can see the truth and be deceived no more, and is working through the great horror of the Book of Revelation, which is in fact the Roman Catholic institution, the Vatican, and Satan carefully put the Virgin Mary before the people and used it as Fatima under the auspices of Fatima. Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, to get people's attention away from the true sovereign, Yahusha, our Messiah. Trade Catholics attempt to go through their church system to try to get through to heaven, but there's only one way to the Shamayim, to the heaven above, and that's through Yahusha. There is no other way or back door. And using a similar trick, the Vatican helped place up a militant and sophisticated religion to keep the children of Ismail from knowing the only one who could get them to Shamayim, to heaven. The Muslim multitudes look to their religion in Muhammad, whose body is still lying in Medina, and with all their hearts towards Mecca for their salvation and the blame for this goes directly to Rome for this unspeakable crime and in this video you are going to know the way truth and the Kaya the life who is Yahusha whose name means that Yahua is salvation Yahua so in summary so far, the Roman Catholic Church was used as a tool by Satan himself as the beast system 
in order to spread conflict and war and divide and conquer using religion to do so. A lot of Arabs back then converted to Roman Catholicism and were then used as spies by the beast Roman Catholic Church to infiltrate Islam and the Arab world in order to spread and infiltrate all over. The Vatican needed to create their false Arab Messiah in order to attempt to stop the real great news and those who were spreading it. And so they hired Khadijah Muhammad's wife and also her cousin Rabaka in order to help facilitate in such a scheme and manipulated Muhammad in order to push such a scheme. This is the conquest of North Africa. All of this done in an attempt not to allow the great news from spreading into the Arab world. And the Jesuits then wanted Arabs and Muslims to believe that they were giving homage to Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, when really this is not the case. This is what? Isis worship, idol worship, idolatry. And they purposely built up all these things such as the Kaaba and Mecca and purposely fooled Muslims into thinking that Fatima is portrayed as the daughter of Muhammad when like we said it's actually idolatry worship and this is all in place to attempt to hide and blind the Muslims from the truth and same with Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity also not anymore because the truth is now being revealed to you today and then created the Quran based on false visions in order to attempt to diminish the truth about the real great news and I'm going to be exposing the Quran and even the Hadith because there are a ton of contradictions and things that just do not add up about it. Like right here in Surah 86, Ayah 6 through 7, where Muhammad said, semen originates from between the backbone, but the semen originates from the testicles. But now we will also be going over and talking about the spiritual component of Islam so you can continue to see the whole truth. And the first thing we're going to expose is the religion itself and even what the word means. Because some say that Islam actually means peace in Arabic. However, an Arabic word only has one root. The root word for Islam is al-sim, which means submission or surrender. All seem submission does not mean the same thing as all salam peace because if it did mean the same thing they would use the exact same word and these are two different concepts and even according to Johns Hopkins University the etymology of the word religion because yes Islam like Christianity and all the other religions they are religions that word etymology comes from religio which means what to bind to bind again because of the re religion means to bind again and that's why I'm doing this video so you can break out of the bondage of religion and be deceived no more because just as our true Messiah Yahusha says, the truth will make you free. Now a predominant symbol that you see in Islam is known as the hand of Fatima, also known as Khamsa, which means number five in Arabic. Now in Islamic tradition, the hand represents the five pillars of Islam, which are Shahada, which is faith, Salat, which is prayer, Psalm, which is fasting, Zakah, which is almsgiving, and also Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. This hand can also represent Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein, the main five that make up the Muhammad family but is mostly attributed to the daughter of Muhammad known as Fatima and is supposed to be a symbol of luck and fortune and also wealth. But who is the deity of fortune and where does all of this come from? The father of all lies, G-O-D, Satan, or name for Satan because that's exactly what it means in the Hebrew fortune, a Babylonian deity of fortune that represents Satan. This can also be known as the eye of Fatima too because you see the giant one eye right in the middle of the palm of the hand. Who does that remind you of? Eye of Horus, the eye of Ra, mystery, Egyptian, Babylonian religion all over again just like in the dollar bill on top of the pyramid, the capping of the new world order. That's what that represents. It stems from Egyptian religion. 
Now the Khamsa is not only seen in Islam, but it's also seen in other religions such as Christianity and even Judaism too, and it predates all of these religions by at least thousands of years. And it has been theorized also that its origins lie in ancient Egypt or even Carthage, and it's been associated with another deity also. So you see, it's nothing new under the sun. You even see a similar hand right here that's commonly attributed to Miriam, the sister of Moses, right here in Judaism. And you even see right here the pentagram, which represents what? The satanic star, the satanic pentagram. This has to do with who? The star of Molech. And in early Christianity, this hand symbol was used to and attributed to Mary. This is nothing new. This has nothing to do with Fatima whatsoever, but this is a satanic symbol and satanic worship. And once again, this is nothing new. You see this attributed all over different religions. You see the one-eyed symbolism even right here in Asian religions. You see it right here, and you even see it again with the same hand symbol and Jewish traditions. Now, when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism, the hand represents chakras. And what this really is doing is that it's portals and invitations to demons and demonic evil spirits. That's what you're doing when you have these hand of Fatimas all over, plastered all over the place as jewelry and wall hangings. You're allowing demons and evil spirits in, in any type of variations of this hand, regardless of the religion, even in Hinduism and Buddhism. It's believed by some that this hand is supposed to provide defense against the evil eye, but is that really what it's doing? Where does all of this stem from? Once again, all roads lead to Rome because where does the idea of the Hamza come from? It comes from Rome because here's the Manopantia, which was used in Rome hundreds of years before the hand of Fatima and all the other ones. It says in Rome, this little hand is well known and is called by everybody the Manopantia. The use of hand gestures giving blessing is an ancient motive in art. This particular gesture of the fingers is known as the Manopantia, which predates Christianity and can be seen in pagan motives to ward off the evil eye and ancient Egyptian artifacts invoking parental protection. But notice how you have a similarity between all these different religions and all of the hand gestures that these religions have because they're showing you that they're all the exact same thing. It's the worship of Satan. All of these hand gestures, including the hand of Fatima and the all-seeing eye, which is where that eye stems from and gets its pagan roots from, it's all pagan in origin. Notice how these idols hold up the exact same hand gestures representing idolatry because this is showing you Mary holding up that same hand gesture and I've gone over this and talked about it in previous videos, plenty of videos with the two fingers up and the two fingers down just as we saw with ancient Rome. Buddha holds up a similar hand gesture right here with the two fingers up right there and also the 666 and even though the 666 right here I'm telling you where does it all come from? There's Krishna who's also holding up the hand gesture too similar to the Kamsa and another hand gesture right there and the list goes on and on when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism specifically. But that same satanic hand gesture, the one we just went over, the one that's used for the same purposes to ward off the evil eye that was used in ancient Rome, well, guess who else holds it up too? J.C. You see the two fingers up and the two fingers down, also held by the popes themselves too. Have you ever wondered where that hand gesture comes from? Have you ever wondered why they hold up that hand gesture? Because they're giving homage to who? The satanic Baphomet, who also holds up the exact same hand gesture as above so below is the motto and that's where it comes from and that's who you're giving homage to when you have the hand of Fatima because it comes and stems from the exact same thing. Now there are claims made that are said that the hand of Fatima is to ward off the evil eye, but do you see how Satan plays both sides? Do you see how Satan plays both the good and the evil? Because both are evil, both are just as bad, and what both do is that they give invitation for demons. Any type of use of amulets or charms such as the Kamza, the hand of Fatima, allows in demons.
You're allowing and opening up doorways for demons and evil demonic spirits to come into your house or shop or wherever you have these jewelries and these hangings and these carvings. Also, no graven images, just like what was given to Musa or Moses from the creator, Yahuwah himself. No graven images. That includes the hand of Fatima. All of these Nazars and all of these amulets and things, they are forms of graven images and also are forms of demonic worship. And as I have just shown you, it stems from Rome. The usage of the Kamsa can also be traced all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Mesopotamian religion, which came thousands and thousands of years ago. And as you can see right here, it's also a universal sign of who the deity Ishtar and Inanna, just like with Easter. So when Christians celebrate Easter, they're actually celebrating Ishtar Semiramis. That's who the Virgin Mary represents. That's who Fatima represents. They're the exact same thing. It's no different. And as I'm showing you and proving to you, all of these religions go hand in hand. They're very similar. That's why it's time to come out of the bondage known as religion, Islam included. That's why our creator says we are not to have any type of witchcraft or sorcery or any type of charms and spells because it's a form of witchcraft and it allows demons in. Be deceived no more. And prayerfully, you also understand, too, that these charms and amulets, they do not ward off the evil eye, but rather they actually give more power to it. It is a grand delusion, and that is what the enemy has done, has made evil look good and good evil, not anymore. Because these are spiritual portals that allow demons in, but no longer will you be deceived anymore. But it's even true with prayer beads, also more graven images. And you see this all over embedded in how many religions, but where does it come from? All roads lead to Rome. And you even see it in Islam known as Misbaha. In Turkey, the beads are known as Tespi and they're used for prayer. Now the Misbaha normally consists of 99 beads to assist in prayers. But notice all of this ritual that takes place with it. Note the ritual that's very similar to the rosary beads and praying the rosary. Also, now it's just the same difference in Islam too. It's the exact same thing. And they say that the 99 beads also refer to the 99 names of Allah. Well, that's interesting how it's 99 names. Because last I checked, according to scripture and according to our father himself that was given to Masha, Musa, Moses, according to the law, our creator has one name and one name alone. Somebody is lying to you. And once again, this is no different than Christianity. It's no different than Roman Catholicism. And note the two hand gestures right there, the demonic hand gesture. It's the same thing as the prayer rope along with the rosary and the rosary beads which is used for roman catholic church it's the same thing do you see the similarities between roman catholicism and islam and where islam gets the misbaha from they get it from the rosary they get it from the roman catholic church and notice how with the rosary beads they use it in the catholic church for counting the component prayers and also a homage to mary it's the same thing do you see the similarities here all of this is based on tradition. All of this is based on religion and reciting in different prayers. But who are you actually really praying to? Then there's also the Dikar, which is the name of the devotional acts in Islam, in which short phrases or prayers are repeatedly recited silently within the mind or aloud. But this is comparable to the rosary beads of Catholicism and the Japa Mala of Hindu tradition. Do you see how all of these religions are the same exact thing? the same beads the same reciting of prayers and then you also have the japa mala or commonly known as mala in the sanskrit which means garland and this is a string of prayer beads that's commonly used by hindus buddhists jains and some sikhs for spiritual practice known as sanskrit as japa it is usually made from 108 beads though other numbers are also used Malas are also used for keeping count while reciting, chanting, or mentally repeating a mantra or the name or names of a deity. Huh, that sounds just like what? The Misbaha in Islam. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. They're the exact same thing.
And this has nothing to do with our creator whatsoever. This has nothing to do with righteousness whatsoever, but it's pagan and giving homage to demons, to Satan, as you can see right here. And note how it's in all these religions embedded in Islam, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and even in Wiccan traditions also, and Sikhism and Jainism. It's no different. It's time to come out of these religions because all of this is graven images. And it's no wonder the beast known as the Roman Catholic Church had to take that commandment out and replace it, adding and taking away. Why? Because they know and because they're trying to justify pagan satanic worship and blending and merging all these religions together and the similarities between all of them. Do you see this with both your eyes open now? But who did Muhammad really see in the cave when he had that encounter? Now we're going to be going over and exposing the truth about who Muhammad really saw. And we're going to be quoting from sources such as the Quran itself and even the Hadith. And we're going to start with Surah 53 verses 4 through 9. In this revelation it says, It is not but a revelation revealed, taught to him by one intense in strength. And then verse 6 says, One of soundness, and he rose to his true form. Verse 7 says, While he was in the higher part of the horizon, then he approached and descended, and was at a distance of two bow lengths or nearer, but is this really Gabarayal? Is this really Jibril as it's known in the Arabic or Gabriel as it's commonly known in the English? Well, let's find out because now we're in Surah 96 verses 1 through 5 where it says, Recite in the name of your sovereign who created, created man from a clinging substance. And this is according to the Quran. Verse 3 says, Recite and your sovereign is most generous who taught by the pen. Verse 5 says, taught man that which he knew not. And even right here, we see that this is a problem in verse 2 because it says created man from a clinging substance. Well, the scripture already tells us how our creator created man, and that was from the dust of the ground. This is according to the writings of Musa, as you know him, Masha Moses. It says this in the scripture, created from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. So once again, someone is lying. Who is lying? Let's find out. Because we need multiple witnesses, now we're going to read other accounts of the first revelation of Muhammad and see if this was really from the Ark Messenger Gabarayal, also known as Jibril or Gabriel, or if this was someone else. And we're actually going to be looking at scriptural encounters also, and we're going to be comparing the two to see who this really is. Now this right here is the event of the first revelation of Muhammad recorded in the Hadith via his wife Aisha. And by the way, Muhammad was married to his wife Aisha at about nine years old when she was nine years old and he was 53. And this is recorded from Sahih al-Bukhari, Book 1, Volume 1, Hadith 3. And it says this, and I'm reading this for educational purposes, but it says, The commission of the divine inspiration to Allah's messenger was in the form of good dreams which came true like bright daylight. And then the love of seclusion was bestowed upon him. He used to go in seclusion in the cave of Hira, where he used to worship continuously for many days before his desire to see his family. He used to take with him the journey food for the stay and then come back to Khadijah to take his food likewise again till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. But was it really the truth? The angel came to him and asked him to read. The prophet replied, quote, I do not know how to read. The prophet added, The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more. He then released me and asked again, for me to read, and I replied, quote, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. He then released me and again asked me to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read or what shall I read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, Read in the name of your sovereign who has created all that exists 
created man from a clot. And we already went over this from Surah 96 from the Quran. Read in your sovereign is most generous. And this is quoted from Surah 96 verses 1, 2, and 3. Then the messenger returned with the inspiration and with his heart beating severely. Then he went to Khadijah bint Kuwailid and said, cover me, cover me. They covered him till his fear was over. And after that, he told her everything that had happened and said, quote, I fear that something may happen to me, unquote. So why was he afraid? Why was Muhammad afraid of this encounter? Here is another encounter, as we see, quoted from Ibn Ishaq, and this is a Muslim historian, and this is what he has to say about the encounter. And remember, is this really Gabriel, or is this really someone else who's disguising themselves as a messenger of light? Because the messenger who Muhammad claimed was Gabriel told him to read, and of course, Muhammad responded and said that he could not read, but then it says here, So I read it, and he departed from me, and I awoke from my sleep, and it was as though these words were written on my heart. Now none of all's creatures was more hateful to me than an aesthetic poet or a man possessed. I could not even look at them. I thought, Woe is me, poet or possessed, never shall Kurayash say this of me. I will go to the top of the mountain and throw myself down, that I may kill myself and gain rest. So I went forth to do so, and then when I was midway on the mountain, I heard a voice from the shaman or heaven saying, O Muhammad. So after his first meeting that was supposedly with Gabriel, why is he not only afraid, as we just read above, but he also is possessed and wanted to kill himself and wanted to commit suicide? Also in this account, why was he physically assaulted? Because it says right here, he pressed me with it so tightly that I thought it was death. And this happened more than once. Why would this messenger do this to him if this is supposedly Gabriel? Why would he press him so tightly towards death and then make it so that Muhammad wanted to kill himself, commit suicide, and also invoke and promote fear into him? Who does that sound like? That sounds just like Satan who comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy and cause fear. Now what we're going to do is we're going to test these spirits because that's what scripture tells us to do is test the spirits to see if they're really truly from our creator or if they're from somewhere else. Because Muhammad's not the only one who has claims to have an encounter with Gabarayal or Gabriel or as you know him as Jibreel. Because there are scriptural encounters of Gabarayal in scripture even thousands of years and hundreds of years before there was Muhammad, before Islam even began as a religion. And I'm going to show you that and prove to you and you can see the differences yourself because that's what we're going to test to see if Muhammad's encounter with supposedly Gabriel was the same as these encounters. So we're here in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, and this was thousands of years before before Muhammad was even on the scene and thought of verses 15 through 19 where it says here and it came to be when I Daniel or Daniel had seen the vision that I sought understanding and see before me stood one having the appearance of a mighty man and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai who called and said Gabriel Gabriel make this man understand the vision he then came near where I stood and when he came, I feared and I fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. And the reason that Daniel was fearing was because he saw a vision of the end. And notice here how Gabriel consoles him. Notice here how Gabriel gives him some words of encouragement. But we did not see that in the supposed encounter with Muhammad. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. Verse 18 says, And as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up straight. But this is not what happened with the encounter of Muhammad, because according to Muhammad, he was physically assaulted. But verse 19 says, And said, Look, I am making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath, for at the appointed 
appointed time shall be the end. So you see the two differences here. See how Gabriel tries to help Daniel here? But this is not the case for Muhammad. Another encounter of Gabariel or Gibriel, Gabriel, is seen right here in the book of Luke chapter 1 in the Great News. And this is scripture according to the Quran also. So now we're in the Injil and we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 1 verses 11 through 20. And you're going to see the encounter that Gabariel, also known as Gibriel or Gabriel, the encounter that he had with the parents of Yahya, also known as Yaukanan, John the Baptist. And so we're going to be reading together. And again, note the differences between the supposed encounter with Muhammad. Verse 11 says, and a messenger of Yahua appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense and when Zechariah saw he was troubled and fear fell upon him but the messenger said to him do not be afraid Zechariah for your prayer is heard when Muhammad was afraid why didn't Gabriel say this to him why did he not say do not be afraid let's keep going and your wife Alishaba shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Yaukanan and you shall have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. Now, Yaukanan is known as Yahya in the Arabic. Verse 15 says, For he shall be great before Yahua, and shall drink no wine and strong drink at all, and he shall be filled with the Ruk Akadash, or the made apart spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he shall turn many of the children of Yasharal to Yahua their all. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of all Yahu to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the insight of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for Yahua. And Zechariah said to the messenger, By what shall I know this? For I am old and my wife advanced in years. Verse 19 says, and the messenger answering said to him, I'm Gabariel, who stands in the presence of all, and was sent to speak to you and announce to you this good news. All is short for Alua, but see, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day this takes place, because you did not believe my words, which shall be filled in their appointed time. So going back to verse 13. What does Jibril, Gabriel, Gabarayal, what does he tell Zakariah? He says, do not be afraid. Another witness we have of this is in the same chapter, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 32, and this is concerning the virgin birth. And we see right here another encounter with the messenger, Gabarayal, also known as Jibril or Gabriel, where it says, And in the sixth month, the messenger Gabriel was sent by Alua to a city of Galil named Natsarath, to a maiden engaged to a man whose name was Yosef or Yausab, Joseph of the house of David. And the maiden's name was Mariam. And the messenger coming to her said, Greetings, favored one. The master is with you. Baruch or blessed are you among women. But she was greatly disturbed at his word and wondered what kind of greeting this was. And the messenger said to her, Do not be afraid, Mariam, for you have found favor with Alua. And see, you shall conceive in your womb and shall give birth to a son and call his name Yahusha. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the Most High, and Yahuwah Alua shall give him the throne of his father, David. So now we have more than two witnesses to establish this matter, just as scripture tells us. We need two or more witnesses to establish any type of matter whatsoever, and we have them right here, because even right here in this encounter with Mariam and Joseph, we even see in verse 30 where it says do not be afraid mariam so we see twice where gabriel tells them not to be afraid and also the account from daniel where gabriel consoles him and gives him encouraging words but yet with muhammad the exact opposite was done therefore gabriel was not the messenger who spoke to muhammad it was obviously someone else it was a demon because we know he was demonically possessed it was satan himself who was speaking to muhammad
Now that we have just used scripture and the Quran and the Hadith itself to prove that it was not Gabriel who had an encounter with Muhammad, now I'm going to show you even in the Quran and other places that Muhammad was in fact demonically possessed and had an encounter with the demon, probably Satan. And we're here in the Quran, Surah 69, and we're going to be reading from Ayah 40 through 42, where it says that indeed the Quran is the word of a noble message messenger, and it is not the word of a poet, little do you believe. Verse 42, nor the word of a soothsayer, little do you remember. Why would this word even be mentioned right here in this passage? Surah 81, Ayah 22 through 25 also relate to the same thing about demonic possession. And we're here where it says, and your companion is not at all mad. And he has already seen Gabriel in the clear horizon. And Muhammad is not a withholder of knowledge of the unseen. And the Quran is not the word of a devil expelled from the heavens. What does this verse sound like? It sounds just like what? Yashayahu, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12. How Satan has fallen, expelled from the heavens. Who does that sound like? Who does that represent? Who is this reminiscent of? There are other sources also where Muhammad has even admitted to demonic possession, like right here in Al-Hadiz, volume 4, page 367, where it says, Anas reported that Gabriel appeared before the apostle while he was playing with some boys. Gabriel took him, laid him down, pierced his heart, and took out a clot of blood, but we don't see that happening to any of the encounters when Gabriel appeared to both Miriam and Zechariah hundreds of years before, and even Danayal, Daniel, thousands of years before. But then it goes on to say, then he said, this is the portion of you possessed of a devil. Do you see this? Next, he washed it in a gold cup with water from the well, Zamzam. Thereafter, sewed him up and took him back to where he found him. Why would it even say possessed of a devil? Do you see where this is coming from? Do you see where the Quran is really coming from? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's coming from demonic possession. Here are more sources that also state the same thing where the satanic verses were present in the original version of the Quran when Muhammad was trying to woo the Meccans who believed in many idols, including the pagan ones that are listed right here. But it even says right here, later on when he was in a more commanding position, he conveniently edited out these verses admitting that they were inspired in him by Satan, quote, we have not sent a messenger or prophet before you when he recited, the devil would intrude into his recitation, Surah 22, verse 53. Muhammad admitted that he had a jinn demon up his nose, and this is according to Al-Hadith, volume 4, book 54, number 516. Muhammad said that bad dreams are from Satan, Al-Hadith, volume 4, book 54, number 513, and according to his supposed encounter with Gabriel, that sounded like a bad dream. So what is that from? Who is that from? Muhammad had his own resident demon, the one-eyed Dajjal, according to Al-Hadith, volume 3, page 803. But this was something that Muhammad even experienced as a child. Then we even see right here an experience Muhammad had. When Muhammad was a child, he was nursed by a Bedouin woman. During this time, he had an experience with, quote, two men in white raiment. Here is W.M. Watt's translation of Ibn Ishaq's biography of Muhammad, page 36, where it says, quote, Two men in white clothes came to me with a golden basin full of snow. They took me and split open my body. Then they took my heart heart and split it open and took it out from a black clot which they flung away. Then they washed my heart and my body with that snow until they made them pure. This event deeply disturbed the Bedouins and they returned Muhammad to his mom. Here is the story told by Muhammad's wet nurse related in Gualame's translation of Ibn Ishaq page 72 who is a Muslim historian by the way. His Muhammad's friend's dad said to me quote I am afraid that this child has had a stroke. So take him back to his family before the result appears. She, Muhammad's mom, asked me what happened and gave me no peace until I told her. When she asked if I feared a demon had possessed him, I replied that I did. So we even see that Muhammad had been demonically possessed even as a child. 
Also from Tabari volume 9 page 167 note 1151 says quote the pre-islamic arabs believed in the demon of poetry and they thought that a great poet was directly inspired by demons this explains why muhammad thought he was demon possessed or influenced by demons and also explains why the quran in many places reads like poetry Muhammad's suicidal thoughts are also quoted in Muhammad at Mecca in pages 40 and 41 that also references and attributes and documents that Muhammad had suicidal thoughts from Azuri's material. Muhammad also had experiences with evil spiritual powers, and we know we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but Muhammad has even been bewitched by magic in all its effects, and this is even recorded in the Hadith of Bukhari, volume 7, number 660, narrated by his wife Aisha, whom he married when she was 9 years old, and he was 53 years old, by the way which states that magic was worked on him so that he used to think that he had sexual relations with his wives while he actually had not. Do you see this magic and sorcery going on here? There is another reference to this made in the life of Muhammad, page 240, that says where Gwalami notes that a Muslim scholar says that the spell lasted for a year. In other words, for one year, Muhammad thought that he was having sexual relations with his wives when he was not. Obviously, he was really lost. You can also read more about this in Bukhari, volume 4, number 490, volume 7, number 658, Volume 7, number 660, which we've just read. Volume 7, number 661. Volume 8, number 89. And Volume 8, number 400. Additional details on this event are also provided in Ibn Sa'ad's Book of the Major Classes, Volume 2, pages 244 through 248, with this relevant quote, The Apostle fell ill. He was bewitched about women and food. There were eleven knots in the hair from the comb. The two surahs, number 113 and 114, were revealed to him. No sooner did the Apostle recite it a verse than a knot loosen. When all of them were loosened, he regained his urge for food and women. More proof of demonic possession comes from Muhammad, who used to wear a talisman to ward off the evil eye. And just like I've just proven to you, and just as we've shown you earlier, what do those talismans and kamzas represent? They represent what? The invitation of demons. Furthermore, proving that Muhammad was indeed demonically possessed. Isn't this interesting also because Gabriel, is this a messenger, an angel, or is it really a demon? Because in the interpretation, al Qurtubi writes, quote, a demon in the form of an angel. The translation here is al Abyad, a demon, is the friend of the prophets, and he is the one who went to the prophet in the form of Gabriel. Another source mentions here with the translation by the demon called al Abyad, the white one, he was referring to the one that used to come to the prophet in the form of Gabriel, wanting to seduce him. What does this sound familiar of? Doesn't Satan disguise himself as a messenger of light? And there is even evidence also quoted from Bukhari or non-Muslims called Gabriel Satan, where it says, Gabriel did not come to the prophet for some time, and so one of the Kuryash women and said his Satan has deserted him. So based on historical and also scriptural accounts, we see that Muhammad was in fact a false prophet. And we even see this being proven also in Deuteronomy, Debarium, chapter 18, verses 18 through 22. And this is what was given to Musa, Masha, commonly known as Moses, where it says, I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And 
and it shall be the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I require it of it. Notice how it says in my name. We've just gone over the name of the creator and how it's Yahua and how it is not what is being purported by Muhammad. But verse 20 says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other mighty ones, even that prophet shall die. And when you say in your heart, how do we know the word which Yahua has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of Yahua and the word is not or comes not, that is the word which Yahua has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Well, did Muhammad make any such false statements? Let's see and let's find out with historical accounts and even the scriptural accounts and compare the two because it says when Muhammad conquered the pagan Mecca, it worshiped 360 idols. The four most important among them were the moon deities right here. Muhammad's attempt to impose monotheism by just keeping one of them and getting rid of the other 359 Meccan idols faced resistance from the Meccans who held the three daughters very dear. Eager to be accepted as a prophet in the native Mecca, Muhammad initially conceded that Allah approved of these three, but unable to reconcile three extra idols with his declared monotheism, Muhammad later reversed himself, confessing, quote, and this is from Al-Tabari, the history of Al-Tabari, volume 6, page 111, quote, I have fabricated things against Allah and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken, and even said that he mistaken the words of Shaitan or Satan, but all of these words that Muhammad is speaking is the word of Satan because all of these encounters were from Satan, were from demons, not from the creator and not from Gabarayal, Gabriel, as we've just proven, thereby showing you and proving to you that Muhammad is in fact the false prophet. False prophets are also exposed in scripture itself in Yarm Ya'u, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 25 through 27, where it says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsehood in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Till when shall it be in the heart of the prophets, the prophets of falsehood and prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone relates to his neighbor as their ancestors forgot my my name for Baal, and that's exactly what happened with Muhammad and Allah. Baal is what that is. Forgetting the name of our creator Yahua and substituting it with B A A L and L O R D and A L L A H and J E S U S. That's why Yahuwah says, see, I am against the prophets, declares Yahuwah, who use their tongues and say, he declares, see, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares Yahuwah, and relate them and lead my people astray by their falsehoods and by their reckless boasting. But I myself did not send them, nor have I commanded them, and they do not profit this people at all, declares Yahuwah, sounds just like Muhammad. Pictures are worth a thousand words because here's an old painting from Gondar, the Amhara region in Ethiopia that shows a painting from 1456 of Muhammad on a camel being led to hell by the devil. Do you see this? And just like I told the Christians, I care more about your salvation than I do your feelings. And I'm telling you also. Such a picture also depicts and shows the exact same thing right here of Muhammad depicted in hell watching women being tortured. But now I'm going to expose the Quran so you can see the lies for yourself. And we're going to start with the creation account according to the Quran, because in three specific verses, it mentions the creation account being created in six days in Surah 7, Ayah 54. Along with Surah 10, uh, Ayah 3, it says six days right here that the heavens and the earth were created. And also Surah 11, Ayah 7, it says six days right here, as you can see in the English. But what happens when we go to Surah 41? This is what it says in Ayah 9, 11 through 12. And we're going to read all of it because it says, Say, do you indeed disbelieve in he who created the earth in two days and attribute to him equals? That is the sovereign of the world. So this says two days. But if we keep going to verse 10, it says, 
And he placed on the earth firmly placed mountains over its surface, and he baruched or blessed it, and determined therein its creatures' sustenance in four days, without distinction for the information of those who ask. So two plus four is six. Then it says, Then he directed himself to the heaven while it was smoke, and said to it and to the earth, Come into being willingly or by compulsion. They said, We have come willingly. Verse 12 then says, and he completed them as seven heavens within two days and inspired in each heaven its command and we adorned the nearest heaven with lamps and as protection that is the determination of the exalted in might the knowing do you see a problem with this do you see the contradictions how it took six days to create the heavens and the earth according to chapters 10 verse 3 and the other chapters that we read in chapter 7 verse 54 and 11 verse 7 but then in chapter 41 it took eight days so which one is it six days or eight days you see the contradictions contradiction is right here in Quran surah 22 ayah 47 where it says and talks about the counting of the years well right here it says a thousand years but then in surah 70 ayah 4 it says here that it's 50,000 years so which one is it is it a thousand years or is it 50,000 years Another contradiction in the Quran is the question, who was the first Muslim? Because according to Quran, Surah 39, Ayat 12, this lets you know that it's Muhammad. Surah 7, Ayat 143, lets you know that it's Musa, commonly known as Moses, Masha, in the Yaudiyat Hebrew language. Surah 2, Ayah 132, lets you know that it's Abraham or Abraham, or as in the Arabic, Ibrahim, who's Muslim in the first of them. And notice how it says religion right here. We just went over that religion means to bind again. The Quran is demonically inspired of Satan, just as I'm proving you, which is why it's false. It's time to test these spirits and wake up to the truth. But it doesn't stop there because in Quran Surah 26, in the account of the Pharaoh in the Exodus, it tells you here that the Egyptian magicians are the first Muslims. Surah 3, Ayah 33 says that Adam, Noah, and the family of Ibrahim were Muslims also. So the question still remains, which one was it? Do you see the lies and the deceptions being exposed from the Quran? The hereditary laws also don't add up either because here we are in Quran Surah 4, Ayah 11 and 12. And it says right here that they were instructed concerning your children for the male what is equal to the share of two females. But if there are only daughters, two or more, for them is two thirds of one's estate. And if there's only one, for her is half. And for one's parents to each one of them is a sixth of the estate if he left children. But if he had no children and the parents parents alone inherit from him then for his mother is one third and if he had brothers or sisters then for his mother is a sixth after any bequest he may have made or debt your parents or your children you know not which of them are nearest to you in benefit and then if we keep going all the way down to verse 12 right here it then says and for you is half of what your wives leave if they have no child but if they have a child for you is one fourth of what they leave after any bequest they may have made or debt and for the wives is one fourth if you have leave no child but if you leave a child then for them is an eighth of what you leave after any bequests you may have made or debt and if a man or woman leaves neither ascendants nor descendants but has a brother or a sister then for each one of them is a six but if they are more than two they share a third after any bequest which was made or debt as long as there is no detriment caused so something is not adding up because the wife receives an eighth, the daughter's two-thirds, a father one-sixth, then a mother one-sixth. Well, this adds up to 27 out of 24 or 112.5%. What about the issue of wine? Because the Quran says in Surah 5 verse 90 that it's Satan's handiwork. But then in Surah 47 15, it says the Shamayim or the heavens above has rivers of wine. Was Muhammad in Mecca for a total of 10 years or a total of 13 years because there are two different accounts of this in the Bukhari?
What will happen to the clouds on the day of judgment? Well, according to the Quran in six different accounts, in the first one in Surah 25, 25, it says they will burst. But then it says in Surah 78, 19, that they will open like doors or gates. Surah 70, verse 8 says they will become like molten copper. Surah 55, 37 says they will be red like burning oil. Surah 21, 104 says that they will roll up like paper. And then Surah 44, 10 says that they will become like smoke. Which one is it? The Sahih Muslim claims that the Dajjal is blind in the right eye, but then also claims that it's blind in the left eye. When it comes to Muhammad being a prophet for all mankind, well, the answer is yes, according to Quran, Surah 33, verse 40. But then, according to Quran, Surah 14, verse 4, he was only sent for the Arabs. Sounds like a false prophet to me, just as we've even proven. And no, the Quran is not inspired by the Creator, but rather is satanically inspired. Here are more lies of the Quran to show you that the Quran is not inspired by the Creator but is a work of Satan. Because in Quran Surah 33 verse 4 it says adopted children are not family. But then in Quran Surah 4 verse 23 it says a foster mother is part of the family. Why? Because Satan wants to be like the Most High. And what has Satan done? Has forged the Quran and has done his own work through the Quran using Muhammad to do so. Because there's even a contradiction when it comes to the number of messengers or commonly known as angels who helped Muhammad. Because in Surah 8 verse 9 it says that there were a thousand. But if you go right here to Surah 3 verse 124 it says 3,000. So which one was it? Was it 3,000 or was it 1,000? Going back to the creation account, what about the creation account? Because there are five different stories and contradictions here. First in Surah 96 2 where it says from a clinging substance, but then right here in Surah 21 verse 30 it says made from water every living thing. So now it went from a clinging substance or a blood clot to now water. And then this verse right here in Quran Surah 15 verse 26, it says that they certainly created man out of clay from an altered black mud. Surah 3 verse 59 says that they were created from dust. And then Surah 19 verse 67 says created out of nothing. So it looks like there are five different accounts, five different contradictions here. Do you see the scheme and the agenda of Satan through this book? Quran also indicates that human beings will be questioned on the day of reckoning come day of judgment in Surah 37 verse 24 and also Surah 7 verse 6. However, in Surah 55 39, this is a contradiction because here it says on that day, none will be questioned about transgression, neither man nor jinn. And what about the flood account? Because here in Surah 21, 76, it says that the entire family of Noah was saved from the flood. However, when you go to Surah 11, verse 42, it says Noah called to his son who was apart from them. And if you keep reading on in verse 43 in Surah 11, it even tells you that the son actually drowned. But what we just read, I thought it said that he survived and the entire family survived. Do you see all of these contradictions? However, one thing that the Quran does in fact have correct is the concept of the flat earth because yes, the earth is in fact flat and if you actually take a look at scriptures, there are over a hundred verses that also prove and state the same thing. Now, although this part is true and the Quran does have correct, the levels of Shamayim or the levels of heaven this is what the enemy has been doing, blending truth with a bunch of lies because the enemy deceived the entire world, Muslims included, Islam included.
Now there are tons more verses that I can go over in the Quran exposing it and showing you the contradictions but these are some of the main ones and then even these ones also where it says Allah being the best of deceivers. It says here according to the Quran Allah is quote the best of deceivers. The phrase is often translated into English as best of planners, best of schemers, or best of plotters but the root word makar means deception. Hence the following Quran verses should be rendered as follows in Surah 3 verse 54 and they the unbelievers plan to deceive and Allah plan to deceive the unbelievers and Allah is the best of deceivers and it says it also here in Surah 7 verse 99 and also in Surah 8 verse 30 who do you think that is who is the deceiver of the entire world Satan is that's who Allah is Allah is Satan Baal worship. Of course, the translators for the English, they had to put planners here because they're in on the scheme too when it should say deceiver because it comes from the root word deception right here. And same for this verse here, a trick and scheme of the enemy because it says plan, but it should say deceit. And same for this one right here, it says best of planners, but it should say deceivers as we've even just proven. And for those who are claiming that this is Tarif, or claiming that there's been changes to the scriptures, well, I'm here to tell you that it's the exact opposite, and that's what the enemy wants you to think. Because Tarif was first leveled against the scriptures in the 11th century by a Muslim named Ibn Khazim. According to Ibn's Tarif, when the passages in the Quran contradict passages in the scriptures, it is the scripture passages that have been corrupted but not the Quran itself. Well, there are two problems with this. The first problem is that the scriptures had been around thousands before there even was Islam and even thousands of years before Muhammad. So any claim of textual corruption needs to present evidence of the supposedly corrupted text before their supposed corruption. Neither Ibn Khazin or anyone since him has produced any such evidence of Tarif. And secondly, to claim tarif or corruption of the scriptures, well, that would contradict Muhammad in the Quran also because actually Muhammad attests to the accuracy of the scripture where Muhammad even says no change is there in the words of Yahuwah. That is what is the great attainment. And also in Quran 10, 94, it says, so if you are in doubt about that which we've revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your sovereign, so never be among the doubters. And who is the truth according to scripture itself, even according to the Quran? Yahusha, the Messiah, is the way and the truth and the kaya, life. Now some Muslims try to debunk this with the Quran 378 where it says, and indeed there is among them a party who alter the scriptures with their tongues, so you may think it is from scripture, but it's not from the scripture. But notice how it says with their tongues. This is talking about what? Oral traditions like Judaism and the Talmud. And even worse, also what's allowed in Islam under Sharia law is taqiyya, which means is lying to advance or protect Islam. Muslims justify taqiyya from the Quran, other Islamic texts, and the actions of Muhammad, including those below. But doesn't the word of our creator say not to bear false witness and not to lie at all? So why is the lying allowed in Islam? And let's not forget about Nasq or the abrogation of certain texts and Islamic texts in the Quran which have been changed and altered even after the supposed encounter with Gabriel. And of course we just exposed that was actually Satan, not Gabriel, who appeared to Muhammad and had Muhammad write down the Quran. And there are several Quranic verses that state that some revelations have been abrogated and superseded by later revelations according to Quran Surah 2 verse 106 and also according to Quran Surah 16 verse 101. And in fact, 71 of the Quran's 114 surah contain abrogated verses according to one estimate. What this means is that there have been several changes and alterations. But according to the word of our creator, his word does not change. He does not change. So why all of these changes? Adding and taking away because it's false and the Quran has been exposed. As a work of the devil, as a work of Satan, as a work of demons because 
because Muhammad was demonically possessed. I'll link even more Quran contradictions in the description box below, but now we're going to go over what the mark of the beast really is and how it relates to Islam. And like we said earlier ago, all roads lead to Rome because now we're here in Kazun, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, where it says, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads names of blasphemy. The beast identified in Revelation 13, the beast of the sea, is the Roman Catholic Church. Note how the Pope wears a Mitra hat from Babylon, fish worship of the sea, you see? There's something fishy about this indeed. Do you see the similarities? How the Pope is wearing the Mitra hat, which is the same thing that was worn in Babylon and Assyria. Nothing new under the sun. It's the exact same thing, ancient fish worship. Because it's the beast of the sea where all of these different religions come from, this is who they pay homage to. And as you have just learned in this video, this is the same entity and organization that's behind all of these religions and pushing them, Islam included. How does the beast relate to Islam? Well, I'm going to show you because now we're in Kazun, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, where it says, Here is the discernment. He who has understanding, let him calculate the number of the beast. And his number is 666. Now, I've covered this in detail from my Mark of the Beast video, but in a brief summary, it's these three Greek symbols right here that Yaukanan, or as you know him as Yahya the Apostle, actually saw these three right here. And as you can see, this is the text and how it looks in the ancient Greek text of the 666 that's talked about in Revelation chapter 13 right here. Huh, this looks very similar, doesn't it? Now, what is the mark of the beast? Here is the discernment because it's multiple things. It's not just one thing. But if you looked at my video, Mark of the Beast, then you would see, and I've shown too in that video, covering what the real mark truly is, which is what religion, anything that's based on the Roman Catholic Church. In that video, we also cover, too, the mark and image of the beast, which is what the cross is, the mark of the beast, crossing out salvation. And by the way, the real true Messiah, Yahusha, was not nailed to a cross. He was hung on a tree, and there are plenty of scriptures to even prove his being hung on a tree, who were the only group of people you know in history who have been hung on trees, especially when it says, cursed is everyone who hangeth on a tree, and that the Messiah was made a curse for us. And as you will see in a minute to come, the cross has to do with what? Crossing out salvation from your heart. Crossing out the truth. That's what it has to do because that is the lawless one. JC, the lawless one. And if you have not already taken a look, please take a look at my video, The Pagan Origins of JC, so you can learn more and so that you can be deceived no more. Now, those same Greek letters that we just went over is also apparent and seen right here in images of JC, the image of the false messiah, by the way. You even see it right here. There it is once again, these same letters that are very reminiscent to the Greek letters that we just saw. And I talk and cover more of this in the Mark of the Beast video. Again, this hand gesture, where else have we seen that demonic satanic hand gesture before? That's why it says they receive a mark on their foreheads, just like with Ash Wednesday, a mark on the forehead, crossing out salvation. The cross is pagan and symbolizes the worship of Tammuz. The worship of ancient Babylon, that's what it is, and this represents what? The crossing out of salvation because the Messiah was in fact hung on a tree. And it's also no surprise either how you even see the cross embedded in other religions and other ancient religions such as the Egyptian cross and even in Egyptian religions known as the Ankh also see how nothing new is under the sun. They had crosses back then and they have them even to this day. And I've done a video covering the pagan origins of the cross also even showing you and proving to you that they even have crosses in ancient Egyptian religion also used thousands and 
and thousands of years ago, even before the Messiah walked the earth in the flesh. And it's the exact same thing, the exact same type of worship. And note the swastika cross here too, because where else do you see that in another religion? Buddha has it too. You see it right here. There's the cross. It's the swastika. It's no different from the Christian cross right there. And what is Buddha holding up? Like something similar to the Kamsa? Very interesting and suspicious indeed. I'm telling you, it's all the same thing. It's time to wake up out of these religions and deceptions. You see this dot right here? What does that represent? The third eye, the evil eye. It's time to wake up out of these deceptions quick because it pays homage to the dead and is the worship of Tammuz and has nothing to do with our true Messiah, Yahusha. And it's no surprise or coincidence either how crosses are attributed to the dead and the worship of the dead. That's why you even see them at cemeteries. But last I checked in the scripture, our creator is the all of the living and not the dead. Also, the beast of the earth in Revelation 13 is talking about who? The earth pig known as Jesus. And like I said, you can watch my video on the pagan origins of Jesus Christ to learn more about that. But even as the book of Revelation chapter 13 says too, that the beast causes all to receive a mark upon their right hand or upon their foreheads. You see the mark of the beast on the forehead? Where else do you see this? The mark of the beast is not just referring to Christianity, it's referring to all these different religions, including Islam, and I'm about to show you that right now, because once again, here is that same exact symbol as we saw, the same Greek letters to represent the 666 or even the 616. But linguistically speaking, what happens when you flip this sign around? Well, if you flip this sideways and place the dot underneath, you get the ba, the letter B in Arabic. And then right here, this looks very similar. If you turn your head to the right, it looks very similar to the Allah, doesn't it? And then these X right here represents what? The Xing out of salvation. But it represents what? Two swords? Where else do you see something very similar to this? Very interesting is this? suspicious indeed. What you are currently looking at right now is an Islamic headband. This is a Muslim badge that's also known as the Islamic Shaheed headband. And this is according to the command of Muhammad found from Quran Tirmidhi 2639. This is also called and known as the Shahadatan. And notice how it sounds very similar to Shaitan, Satan. And what this is, is that this is worn on the head for the Islamic declaration of faith worn on their foreheads but notice what it says right here you see the ba right there the same that's the letter b right there and then the word allah right here and then the two swords right there very interesting and suspicious indeed because that is the exact same thing as what as the revelation sign of the 666 that we just saw only flipped sideways now once again, here is the 666, the mark of Revelation 13, 18 right here, read from left to right. As you can see right here, if you tilt this right here, you get the Ba because there's the Ba right there. And then right here, this is Allah sideways as you see right here. And then the two swords, there's the X right there representing the two swords. And it just so happens that this is worn on your forehead especially when we just went over what Allah actually means, which means to curse. I'm telling you, this is some real stuff because it pays homage to Satan, to the beast. That's who Allah is. And now we're exposing the mark of the beast worn even on your forehead too. It's time to come out of these religions quick, fast, and in a hurry.
Interestingly enough, the scripture also says that the mark is worn on the right hand. Well, guess what? This is the Islamic badge that Muslims wear on their right arm. You see the Ba right there? You see Allah's right there and the two swords? Just like with Revelation chapter 13, it's no different. You see the exact same thing. This is the mark of the beast accepting Satan who is Allah, which is the false name of our creator because Allah as a title is not the name of our creator. This just gives you another look at it so you can actually see that this is not made up and that this is the real truth right in front of you. And now it's time to awaken to the truth and see the real truth that's right in front of you because here's the Greek 666 once again and here is the word the same symbol in Arabic that's seen on Islamic headbands and also Islamic badges too. And just like the cross in Buddhism and just like the cross in Christianity and all of these religions, they all are the mark of the beast because they originate from who? From the Roman Catholic Church, from the beast known as Rome. Here is a clearer picture once again of the Islamic headband. As you can see right here, this is the Ba right there. This is the title Allah because it's not a name and the two crosses that are next to it, the same two crosses that you also see on the Saudi Arabia coat of arms. No surprise or coincidence there either. And once again, look at it sideways. There's the Ba right there. There's the title Allah. And there is the two swords right there, just like on the Islamic headband. It's right in front of you. And again, it represents the cross crossing out salvation, just like the Christian cross, just like the Buddhist swastika and all other religions, period. And that's why this is a warning to come out of these religions and see the whole truth and nothing but the truth that's right in front of you. Because as you see, this right here is on the Muslim headband, is even on the Muslim wristband too. Worn on the forehead and also worn on the right arm. And you're going to get this because the truth is being revealed to you today and all of this that was once hidden from you is no longer hidden because now the truth is being brought to the light. And once again, that's why language is so important. Names are so important because calling on Allah means that you're cursing and you're swearing on the creator. And that is a no-no. That is breaking the third commandment not to take the name of our creator in vain. But it gets even deeper than that because what does this actually look like? What does this title right here in the Arabic, what does this look like and who is this reminiscent of? That's right, it's reminiscent of the serpent and that's who that is. Allah is the serpent, it's Satan himself, that's who it is. And you need to see this with both your eyes open because the truth is finally being revealed and restored unto you even as we speak. And who does the serpent represent? The serpent represents the dragon. And it's interesting because the book of Revelation also talks about the dragon. Where it even says here in Revelation 13 verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. The beast is Rome and the dragon is who? Okay, and then it says, And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Is this what the Muslims are saying when it comes to the Quran? Because notice the sign right here. We have a king who can make war with him. Does this sound familiar to you? And notice also in the Arabic too how this symbol looks like what? A dragon. It looks like a serpent just like we went over. Well, who is the great serpent? Revelation 12, 9 says that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And that is exactly who you are worshiping and who you are paying homage to when you call on Allah, when you call on that title, and when you go to these mosques and worship to Allah, you are calling on Satan, you are calling on the devil, you are taking the mark of the beast in your forehead, which is also your mind. Because when you attach Akbar to the title, you get great. Well, who is great according to Revelation 12, 9? The great dragon, the great serpent.
And yes, it even says that Satan has deceived the entire world. And yes, that includes Islam. Yes, that includes Christianity. Because I've also covered Christianity and the pagan origins of Jesus Christ in another video, which is linked in the description box also. But it's same is true also for Islam. Be deceived no more. It's time to break out of these chains of deception and bondage known as religion, Islam included, and see the truth because the truth is what what makes you free. Is this so important? Because every time you wear this armband, every time you wear the headband, you're giving homage to the beast. You're giving homage to the dragon. You're giving homage to Satan when you call on that pagan title. And even performing demonic, satanic hand gestures when you do this. I'm telling you, this goes much deeper than you think. This is what Rome has been hiding from you all these years, not anymore. Giving allegiance to the beast system, giving allegiance to the beast, giving allegiance to Satan. And this is how Satan has deceived the entire world in order to buy into such a grand illusion and a grand scheme. And it's not just Islam, it's all over the world with all different major religions exposed. Oh, but it gets even deeper than that because when you take a look at the Quran that we've just exposed as a lie and a work of Satan, oh, look very closely and what do you see? You see a reptilian on the Quran. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, the word mark means karagma, which is what? Stamp as a badge of servitude. That's talking about what? Islam itself. So not only is the beast of earth talking about JC and Buddha and Krishna and all those other false messiahs, that's not Yahusha, the true messiah, but it's also the Quran who is the beast of the earth. And it's time to come out of the Quran, come out of the Quranic satanic teachings, come out of these mosques and come out of all religions, all Babylon, quick, fast and in a hurry. So now that we've just exposed what the mark of the beast truly is and how this relates to Islam, now we're also going to go over and talk about the moon worship and ancient pagan worship and how it has blended its way into Islam. And now we're going to go over more pagan origins and the pagan roots of Islam and expose also the moon worship with archaeological evidence so you can see that all of this came thousands and thousands of years before there even was Islam and before Muhammad because nothing new is under the sun. And we'll start with worship at the Kaaba, because according to the Hadith, the Kaaba in Mecca was a center of idol worship, with the Kaaba housing 360 idols, and this is according to Sahih Bukhari, Volume 3, Book 43, Number 658. Muhammad discarded the 360 idols but retained for Islam the Kaaba with its black stone, justifying it with the claim that Abraham or Abraham or Ibrahim and Ishmael originally constructed it. However, there is no historical or archaeological evidence for the existence of the Kaaba beyond a few hundred years before Muhammad's lifetime. In fact, Muhammad's own words disprove any connection he was attempting to make between Abiram, Ishmael, and the Kaaba more contradictions because the Quran, according to Surah 2, verse 125, says that Abraham built it. And that's according to the Quran right here. But then, according to Sahih Bukhari, volume 4, book 55, number 636, it says that according to Muhammad, it was built 40 years prior to the temple at Jerusalem. So which one is it? Because the temple at Jerusalem was built by Solomon around the 950s BCE, according to this. This implies that if Muhammad were to be believed, the Kaaba must have been built approximately close close to the thousands, but Abiram lived around 2000 BCE, and both Abiram and Ishmael would have been dead by then. If Muhammad is correct, then the Quran is wrong. But if the Quran is correct in stating that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba, then Muhammad in the Sahih Hadith is wrong. More lies. The Kaaba has nothing to do with Abraham or Ishmael. It's just what? More pagan worship, pagan idolatry. And we're going to be exposing the Kaaba so you can see it also and see how it also relates to Judaism. 
It has a wholly pagan heritage, and this is according to Egyptian professor and foremost authority on Arabic literature, Dr. Taha Hussein, who said, the case for this episode is very obvious because it is a recent date and came into vogue just before the rise of Islam. Islam exploited it for religious reasons. Thereby, worship at the Kaaba and kissing of the black stone are just the first of many practices adopted from 7th century paganism and repackaged within monotheistic Islam. That's exactly what it is, repackaged paganism, just like Christianity and the cross, no different. You see the similarities? And also, worshiping the Kaaba, the black stone, wood and stone, no graven images. And also, the pagan idols of pre-Islamic Arabia were worshipped in the form of rectangular stones or rocks. For example, the pagan deity Alat, who was mentioned in Quran Surah 5319 and believed by pre-Islamic pagans to be one of the daughters of Allah, was once venerated as a cubic rock at Ta'if in Saudi Arabia. An edifice was built over the rock to mark it apart as a house of worship. And here are the citations here that you can look at from Encyclopedia. Britannica and also the Book of Idols, page 14. And even according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, it says, quote, a principal sacred object in Arabian religion was the stone, either a rock outcropping or a large boulder, often a rectangular or irregular black basaltic rock. Of numerous Beatles, the best known is the Black Stone of the Kaaba at Mecca, which became the central shrine object in Islam. And again, this rock, this stone was kissed even during pre-Islamic pagan worship. Worship to who? The beast, the Satan, the serpent himself. That's who you're giving worship to if you partake in this and if you partake in the Hajj, the pilgrimage. What about praying five times towards Mecca? Well, according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, pagans prior to Islam would pray five times per day towards Mecca. It's ritualistic. And who are you praying to? Because you're not praying to the creator of the universe, Yahuwah, but rather praying to who? The serpent, Satan. Muhammad retained for Islam this pre-Islamic practice, sanctioning it with the story of a night trip to heaven on a mythical beast called Al-Barak. And we also covered that and exposed it. The Hadith also tells us that Allah demanded 50 prayers per day per Muslim. Do you see this more paganistic rituals? And this is also a practice that's seen in Zoroastrianism, which is even a religion older than Islam. So we see that this is nothing new to Islam because this religion precedes Islam by hundreds of years. And then also fasting on the 10th of Muharram, Muhammad's pagan tribe, the Qurayash, fasted on the 10th of Muharram. Though optional, Muhammad retained this pagan practice too. And this is also according to Sahih Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 58, Number 106. 72. And what about Tawaf between Safa and Marwa? Well, during Tawaf between Safa and Marwa is an Islamic ritual associated with the pilgrimage to Mecca. Safa and Marwa were two mounts located at Mecca. This ritual entails Muslims walking frantically between the two mounts seven times. And we're going to be talking about that and exposing that because what is that Satan Saturn worship? This was originally a pagan pre-Islamic practice and then retained it for Islam with yet another so-called revelation in the Quran. And this is also noted in Sahih Bukhari, Volume 2, Book 26, Number 710. Clearly, the Hadith testifies that Muhammad merely adopted this pagan ceremony from the pre-Islamic period of ignorance and justified it with yet another convenient Quranic so-called revelation. But what about the moon symbol that you see all over the place, especially embedded in flags all over the Arab world? Could that be ancient pagan moon worship? Oh, of course it is, because who was the moon deity at the time who Baal was worshipped at the Kaaba? And if you actually look at Hinduism, this is the same as who? It's the same as Shiva.
who is the Indian idol of destruction, representing Satan also, representing demons. The crescent moon was the symbol. Muhammad's pagan grandfather, Abad al-Mutalib, almost slaughtered Muhammad's dad, Abdallah, at the Kaaba, to who this moon idol, and this is according to Ibn Hisham right here. More pagan symbols, just like with the cross for Christianity and the star of David for Judaism. And by the way, that star has nothing to do with David, but has everything to do with Molech. The crescent moon is a universal symbol for Islam is a pagan symbol, more idolatry, idol worship, graven images. So we know that of all the 360 pagan Arabian idols who were worshipped, we know that Alat was one of them, which is even said to be here the feminine form of Allah, but I'm going to prove to you and show you how this was in fact a moon deity. As you can see right here, with archaeology to prove it, there has been archaeologists who've uncovered temples to moon deities all throughout the Middle East, from the mountains of Turkey all the way to the banks of the Nile. The most widespread religion of the ancient world was the worship of the moon deity, and you see this with pre-Islamic crescent moon and star that's from the same location right here, and you see the pre-Islamic and Islamic crescent and star glyphs. You also see the Anatolian. Napoleon, Islamic, and ancient Persian moon deity right here. This ancient pagan moon worship comes from who? The Sumerians, which is what? Babylon, that's where this comes from, and is blended all the way into who? Where it's blended into Islam is still worshiped today because Satan has deceived the entire world. Not anymore because it represents the pagan moon idol and here's more archaeological evidence to show you right there. This is archaeological evidence to show you the moon and the crescent symbol. There's the crescent symbol right here. There's the symbol right there over here as you can see. It's found all over the place you see it and has nothing to do with the worship of the true creator Yahuwah. When the popularity of the moon deity waned elsewhere, the Arabs remained true to their conviction that the moon deity was the greatest of all. While they worshipped 360 of them at the Kaaba and Mecca, the moon deity was the chief one. Mecca was in fact built as a shrine for the moon deity. This is what made it the most sacred site of Arabian paganism and continues even to this day with the religion known as Islam. Just like the words from Shaluma, or as you know as Solomon, nothing new is under the sun. Because yes, Allah is a moon deity. It's the worship of Satan, the worship of the serpent, the worship of the beast. And as you can see right here, a symbol from Ur, ancient Mesopotamia, from the 2000s BCE. What do you see? The moon and the crescent symbol right there, and the star symbol. The moon deity rode on a winged bull, and its symbols were the crescent and tripod, just like today. Day in Islam, nothing new under the sun. Wow, 4,000 years later and nothing has changed. And as we went over earlier in the picture from the Prophet Comet, you see it once again with Allah what is an idol, a moon idol, a photo showing you Allah sitting on the throne with the crescent moon on the chest right here because it's a moon deity. See the moon right there and the star up here just like before, nothing new under the sun. And this is archaeologically proven. This is an archaeological fact. Because all Islam is, is that it's the revival of the ancient moon deity worship, just like Christianity is sun worship by going to church on Sunday. You see how that is? And also the word Monday meaning moon day. And by the way, Hubal, who is the chief idol of Mecca, is also linked to Baal, also known as Hu Tammuz, the same one where you get Babylon and Semiramis from, who is what? The son of Nimrod and the son of Semiramis, and that's also where you get the cross from too. See how it's all linked to Babylonian worship? Come out of her, come out of Babylon, come out of Islam, come out of Christianity, and come out of all these other religions religions, period. And here's more archaeological evidence. You see the moon right there with the crescent star up here, even in Babylonian tradition and archaeology, Baal worship is what this is.
Here is more archaeological evidence from Sumerian, which is what Babylon and represents Baal worship with the crescent moon and the star used thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago before Islam was even thought of. Nothing new under the sun. And it's time you know who you are worshiping and who you are paying homage to and to be deceived no more because you also see the name of Satan in Yasha Ya'u or Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 where it says and uses the phrase son of the morning. Well, when you actually look at that in the Hebrew or the Ya'udiyah, you get Hillel Ban Sha'ar, which means what? Crescent moon and Sha'ar means morning star, as you can see right here. So who does that represent? It represents Lucifer. It represents Satan. And also Muslims mark their food with the crescent mark, which they call Halal, which is clearly a variation of the very name of who? Lucifer Hillel is what that represents. And notice how Halal is A-L-L-A-H, unscrambled, representing Lucifer. Lucifer, Satan, as we've just proven. That's why you see the crescent moon and the star all over Islam. You see it in Islamic flags. You see it on the top of mosques. You see it all over the place. And who does it give homage to? It represents Hillel Ban Sha'ar, the sun of the morning, the crescent moon. That's talking about Lucifer, Satan. It gives homage and worship to Satan. You even see it on the flag of Malaysia and other countries. It's time to wake up and see the truth that's right in front of you and see our creator's name is Yahua and his son's name is Yahusha but the name of Satan Satan has many names that's why in Islam there are different names for Allah 99 of them well another name for Satan is what Hillel and this means what crescent moon morning star Sha'ar and Yashayahu Isaiah 14 12 a title for Satan that's who this gives homage to worshiping the beast worshiping the dragon Satan it's time to wake up out of these delusions because even on the Islamic day of Ashura, what does it say in 1 Kings 18, 28? The prophets of Baal cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And mind you, this was written, what, thousands of years ago, but it's going on even to this day in Islam as we speak because Allah is Baal, Satan worship. Before you think about going on another Hajj or a pilgrimage to Mecca, you need to see this and how closely related the Kaaba is to what? The Tefillin cube and how they share remarkable similarities and this cube can be found where? In ancient Judaism. Because this once a year ritual of circling around the black stone, and we know that the black stone represents what? Wood and stone graven images and has nothing to do with Abraham whatsoever but the worship of pagan moon idols. What this is, is giving worship to who? Saturn, Saturn worship, Saturn or Satan. And that's why the cube worship in the Kaaba and Mecca represents what? Saturn and its color, Balak, who represents Saturn, who represents Satan, who is Molech, Molech worship, which is also represented in the scriptures, nothing new under the sun. And what does this look like up close? It looks like the rings of Saturn going around. It looks like the rings of Saturn of Satan. So every time you partake in the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca, you're giving more power to the beast known as Satan, the serpent. Every time you pray to A-L-L-A-H or even say in the name of A-L-L-A-H, you're giving homage to the beast. And the same goes for L-O-R-D. The same goes for G-O-D because that's the short name of Satan. Satan. Language is so important. And when you know who you're worshiping, then you see the truth that's right in front of you. But it's not just Islam that you see the black cube on the Kaaba because you also see it in places such as Santa Ana, Manhattan, Australia, and even Denmark, and of course with the tefillin, which the Jewish wear on their heads. And by the way, this has nothing to do with scripture whatsoever, but this has to do with what ancient Saturn Satan worship because yes, Judaism is Satanism in disguise.
And it's no wonder then because the word Kabbalah sounds like what? Kabbalah, which is ancient Jewish mysticism, ancient Jewish religion, which is what the Tefillin cube represents. That's what this cube represents. And to the ancient Egyptians, Ka is spirit and Ba is the soul. And you see it's the blending and merging of all these different religions together, just like the Pope is trying to do. You even see it right here with the hexagram. And notice how you get a cube from the cross also. So when you wear a cross, if you're Christian, it's no different than giving worship to the cube, to the beast, to Satan. It's time to come out of these paganisms and see where they truly originate from. Because the black cube was also founded and worshipped also in ancient Egyptian religion too and represents the pagan Egyptian deity of evil, darkness, chaos, war, and conflict. And that's who you're giving homage to if you're worshipping and partaking in the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and also to the moon idols because it's giving homage to who? To Baal, to Satan. Do you see it with both your eyes open? And once again, the cube also represents what? The hexagram, which is the same satanic six-pointed star that has nothing to do with David whatsoever, but is what? The star of Molech, the star of Saturn, Satan worship, also representing and having to do with CERN and opening up portals and doorways. And anytime you do this satanic worship around this rock and stone, what you're doing is you're allowing demons and opening up doorways for demons and even with the Jewish with the Tefillin cube in Judaism. See how they're no different? See how all of these religions are the exact same thing? Just like with the Christian cross that's also a cube and can be formed into a cube? See how they're all the same? And more reason to get out of religion and stop believing the lies of the Quran and stop believing the lies of Satan who is A-L-L-A-H because what does our creator Yahuwah tell Musa or Masha Moses in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 1 in the Torah also known as the Torah neither shall you place any figured stone in your land to bow down unto it. That's why the second command is no graven images, but you see graven images even with the Kabbah, the stone, and we're also going to be talking about the black stone and how that represents phallic worship, but also with these beads as we've gone over embedded in all these other different religions as we see with Buddhism, Islam, Baha'i, and even Catholicism, and also with Hinduism. The cross and all of these pagan titles such as L-O-R-D, G-O-D, and A-L-L-A-H, which all give homage and worship to Satan as we've just proven in this video. But notice how they even have a tree depicted here in Iran. Well, what does this remind you of? It reminds you of the Christmas tree. And by the way, if you actually do the history of Christmas, you would understand that this represents what? The phallic symbol of Nimrod, phallic penis worship. That's exactly what this is. More homage to the beast. It's time to wake up and come out of her Babylon quickly. But what about the black stone? Because that also relates and ties to pagan origin and also phallic worship. And you're going to see the phallic worship and hidden phallic symbols in Islamic architecture and also in mosques. But now we're going to be starting with the black stone. And if you're watching this and if you're Hindu, it's time to come out of that too because Shiva is the stone inside of Shakti's vagina. And you see in Islam, Shiva is inside of the Shakti and in Hindu, the Shiva Yoni right here, which is what? The Shiva Ling, Shakti's vagina. It represents the vagina of more phallic worship, more disgusting phallic symbols that you're paying homage to and worshiping in your respective religions. And this has to do with lingam, which is what? More proof of the mark of the beast. Because notice how lingam in Sanskrit literally means what? Sign, symbol, or mark. Just like what? The mark of the beast? Just like we expose for Christianity and the cross?
And even as we expose to with Islam having to do with the word A-L-L-A-H embedded on the foreheads of minds of people and also on headbands and wristbands, now we even see it in Hinduism also. Do you see the similarities along with the Buddha swastika, which is also across too? I'm telling you, it all relates to the beasts come out of these religions. But this lets you know that the Linga or the Shiva Linga is an abstract or aniconic representation of who? The Hindu deity Shiva, which also is represented and worshipped for Allah also. It's the same thing with the worship of Satan, and it's used for worship in temples, shrines, or as self-manifested natural objects as we even see with the black stones. The Linga is also seen as a symbol of energy and potential of who? The devil himself. And you even see it with the black stone. How disgusting indeed. And you even see a picture of it right there. What are they worshiping? They're worshiping the penis. It's phallic symbols and it's very disgusting indeed because you even see it right there. But there's even been debates about it. You can even see it right here. A lingam with what? A swastika, the cross, the mark of the beast I see at one of the temples in Pakistan I see. Do you see how all of this relates? And by the way, while scholars try to pass this off, they know darn well that pillar worship is a form of, in fact, phallic worship. That's what it represents. You can see it right there, how it looks like a vagina, a penis inside of a vagina. They try to justify because they're trying to lie because Satan is the father of all lies. But now you see the truth with your eyes wide open. Here is another one. What does this look like? What is this very reminiscent of? And like I said, you see it even on the black stone with the Kaaba. You even see it in Hinduism and Buddhism also. What is that telling you? It's telling you that it's time to come out of these religions, come out of Babylon, come out of Islam, and come out of these mosques. Why? Because if you take a look at them, you'll see that these mosques, in them, there is hidden phallic worship and phallic symbols that's hidden even in Islamic architecture, like right here. What does that look like? Even with the phallic mosques right there, you see that this is a phallic symbol, just like with church steeples, and I've gone over this even in my Christian video, exposing Christianity and religion with the church steeples for Sunday sun worship. The steeple represents what? The phallic symbol of Nimrod. It's the symbol of the penis just like the Christmas tree. You even see it right there in Islamic architecture. You see it right here too. What does that look like? Semen. You see it right there again in Islamic architecture and even right here too that looks like the lingam right there, a penis inside of a vagina. More ancient and archaeological proof and evidence even shown right here and how this is nothing new, how this was used even thousands of years ago because here's the Shiva Linga, again, the penis inside of the vagina right there. Number two shows the Shivta ruins of Israel. You can see the phallic symbol right there. Right here also, that's how it was made in architect and design. And then right here, number three is Petra Jordan. You see it right there too. You see the penis right here at Al Hijar in Saudi Arabia and also the mosque dome because what these pillars represent and the pillars of Islam just like with the church steeples they represent the phallic symbol penis worship of who of Nimrod because the ancient story goes in Babylonian tradition that Semiramis the wife of Nimrod who also represents Mary and Fatima what did she do? She gathered up all the pieces of Nimrod after he was killed. Only one piece she did not gather up, which was to be memorialized, and that piece was, of course, the phallic symbol, the penis, which is to be memorialized, and it's memorialized with things such as Christmas, and as you even see right here, even in all these different religions, Islam included. All goes back to Babylon because that's who it represents. It represents the phallic symbol and the Shiva Lingam represents what? The vagina of Semiramis also, the mother and wife of who? Nimrod Baal who represents who? JC and also represents Allah. She was called Ishtar, also pronounced Easter in English and we've gone over that and how abominable it is even in our pagan origins of JC video and have done a separate video on it and why we are not 
to celebrate that hella day and how it has nothing to do with the true Messiah Yahusha whatsoever and also Ashtaroth and Isis now marry. See, nothing new is under the sun. And as we also talked about, it's also Fatima in Islam. Also, nothing new under the sun. All these thousands of years later, and it's even plastered on Starbucks too. And we've covered a video on that also. Do you see how all of what? Thousands and thousands of years later, even in Egyptian religion, is nothing new. And here it is once again, alive and well, mystery Babylonian religion exposed. This type of symbolism is plastered all over the place. It's everywhere hidden in plain sight because it's also at the towers of the house, which is located in Mecca which is a clock tower and has the world's largest clock face and the third tallest building and fifth tallest freestanding structure in the world but do you see how it has the moon symbol on top of it giving homage to who lucifer to satan himself and also the phallic symbol that's what it represents just like the tower of babel no different just like what the tower of nimrod representing the phallic symbol and even this too, which is the largest pilgrimage in Islam known as the Arba'in pilgrimage that typically takes place in Iraq. You could even see right here, these pillars look like what? A phallic symbol. That's what it is. And this typically takes place 40 days following Ashura, the religious ritual for the commemoration of Muhammad's grandson, Hussein Ali's martyrdom in 680. And while this looks like a shrine, well, actually, what does it really look like? It's more phallic worship, phallic symbol, the truth that's right in front of you. And it's also time to get away from all of the Quran and the traditions of the Quran, including these hella days such as Eid al-Adha and also ones like this one, such as the Hajj and Ashura too, because what is Ashura? It is a play in adding and taking away from the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. It's the Islamic equivalent. Why? Because they added and took out the truth because they want you to celebrate this, but not the truth. Just like for Christians, they want you to celebrate Easter, but but not Passover that has to do with the true Passover lamb, Yahusha. Do not be deceived because how does this all relate to the end times? It relates to the end times with the Imam Mahdi, along with Project Bluebeam, Pope Francis and the Vatican, Rome, and the deceptions that are even at the door, end time deceptions and the great delusions that are coming. Because the Imam Mahdi is said to be the Islamic guided one who will appear and rule for 5, 7, 9, or 19 years according to differing interpretations before the Day of Judgment, Yam al Kiyama, literally the Day of Resurrection. And this is only according to the Hadith. Now, in these traditions, it says that the Mahdi will arrive with what you call Isa to defeat the false Messiah or anti-Messiah. But do you see how Satan has everything twisted and everything upside down? Everything is backwards because our true Mashayak Yahusha is Islam's view of the anti-Messiah, while their view of the real Messiah is actually the false Messiah. And same for JC, Buddha, Krishna, and all these other ones because what are they planning to do? When the deceptions start, there will be Project Bluebeam where these false messiahs will appear and then merge into one to form the anti-messiah. And you can learn more about this in our Project Bluebeam video, which will also be linked so you can be deceived no more because great deceptions are coming to a sky near you. That's why your Pope is hard at work and so busy trying to merge all of these religions together and blend all these religions together. And that's why your Pope held the multi-religious service at the 9-11 memorial back in September of 2015, blending and merging all of these religions together in order to form the one world religion for the new world order Babylonian system of the beast. That's why the Pope, who is the false prophet of Revelation, is also stressing interfaith unity and in trying to blend and merge all of these religions together and claims that you're praying to the same G-O-D. Well, who is G-O-D? Because it's not the creator of the universe whose name is Yahuwah, as we've just proven in this video. And note how they're blending all these different religions together. There are the beads again. There's a statue of Buddha once again. And the baby to represent what? The birthing of the new world order. 
But what will the anti-Messiah really try to do? The anti-Messiah will really try to spread war and will try to blend all of these religions, but will be under the auspices of Islam and Sharia law in order to do so. And by now your eyes should be open to the agendas and schemes and plots and plans and tricks of the enemy because the deceptions have been going on for thousands and thousands of years now. But now the enemy is going to try to stage a grand delusion, the strong delusion of these false messiahs. But mind you, these delusions have been going on for thousands of years, even before Islam, before Islam even became a religion and same with Christianity, but now are being fully exposed. That's why your elite and your Illuminati and all the Zionists at the top and the black pope who's running the pope that you see right now, the false prophet, by the way, from the beast known as Rome, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, that's why they are so hard at work also trying to pay courtesy George Soros and all those other elite Zionist terrorists at the top. That's why they're paying for refugees from Islamic countries to invade Europe and even America because what are they going to try to do for the end? times incorporate Sharia law in these specific nations where there is no freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of the press, equality of peoples or equal rights for the women, but you never had rights to begin with even in America per the constitution which was shredded the moment it was signed. This is what we're doing when it comes to exposing the Islamic religion and Muhammad and the Quran. Also, we're testing these spirits. And just like our Messiah, Yahusha tells us the true Messiah, you know them based on their fruits. Because here we also have a handy Sharia law checklist. Sounds perfect for the end times. And although some of these things might sound hard to believe, well, let's actually see based on the truth itself. Let's actually see. Does Islam actually promote bestiality? Let's find out. According to an article dated back from 2006 in Pakistan, sex with animals is a common practice among rural youths and considered a rite of passage into adulthood. And then dated from 2011, a male who was caught having sex with another man's donkey was fined, but the fine was not imposed for having sex with an animal, but rather for committing adultery. And by the way, Pakistan ranked number one as of 2010 for varied search terms such as child sex, rape sex, animal sex, camel sex, donkey sex, dog sex, and horse sex. And as of 2006, Google found that of the top 10 countries when it comes to sex-related sites, six of them were in fact Muslim with Pakistan on the top. The other ones were Egypt at number two, Iran at number four, Morocco at number five, Saudi Arabia at seven, and Turkey at eight. The non-Muslim states were Vietnam at three, India at six, Philippines at nine, and Poland at ten. The Pakistan Daily Report also reported these internet search terms and found them to be common in these Islamic nations. Do you see a pattern here of what will eventually become Sharia law throughout the entire world come the anti-Messiah system using Islam in order to do so to bring about what? Lawlessness throughout the entire world. Bestiality is also common among boys of tribal Arab cultures and according to the Julian Press and other scholars it says quote the pilgrimage to Mecca is not complete without copulating with the camel. And while the Quran makes no mention about bestiality the Hadith makes no prohibition against it to be found in the two Sahih. More contradictions even exposing the Hadith because how can one Hadith say kill the person committing bestiality and the very next one say there's no prescribed punishment for the same person. Both statements cannot be true. About cannibalism, is that allowed too? Well, let's see, because if you read from the Quran, Surah 2, verse 173, it says, He hath only forbidden you dead meat and blood and the flesh of swine, and that on which any other name hath been invoked. But if one is forced by necessity without willful disobedience nor transgressing due limits, then he is guiltless. And then Quran, Surah 16, verse 115, also says the same thing also. But then there's also the commentary of the book of Al-Qurtobi, which is the collector of the Quranic rules. 
And here's where you can find more book in the first volume and of the third edition in page three, who then goes on to continue into the book, where it also says the edition was corrected, edited, and certified by the Council of Islamic Research of Al Azhar, published in 1988. But go to page 716 of this book in volume one, and it says right here, quote, if one is in dire need and found a dead body of an animal, a swine, or of human, he might eat the dead animal because it is halal or lawful permissible, but not the body of a swine. Yet the scholars Ahmad and Dawood protested by saying that Prophet Muhammad said, quote, breaking the bones of a dead body is like breaking the bones of a live body. Al Shafi said, quote, one may eat the flesh of a human body. It is not allowed to kill a Muslim nor a free non-Muslim under Muslim rule because he is useful for the society, nor a prisoner because he belongs to other Muslims. But you may kill an enemy fighter or an adulterer and eat his body. And then you can also read the conversation here, but then Al Arabia said, the proper thing for me is not to eat human flesh unless the person makes sure that this act saves him from starving to death. Could this all be part of the plan to bring Sharia law to places such as Europe and America come the economic collapse and come the end times? Huh, what is this really looking like? Because according to the Hadith, what is not forbidden is pardon. And just like what Salman al-Farisi even said right here in the Hadith from Book 29, Hadith 3492, that whatever is remain silent can be pardoned and also narrated by Abdallah Abbas right here in book 27 Hadith 3791 the people of pre-Islamic times used to eat some things and leave others alone considering them unclean and then it says that marking some things lawful and others unlawful so what he made lawful is lawful what he made unlawful is unlawful and what he said nothing about is allowable and this is of course quoting and referencing quran surah 6 verse 145 that says i do not find within that which was revealed to me forbidden to one who would eat it unless it to be a dead animal or blood spilled out or the flesh of swine but human flesh has not been forbidden could that also explain why there are so-called Africans who are the true people of scriptures who fit the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 being mutilated and cooked like kebabs by Libya gangs with the Libya slave trade that's been going on for how many years? And not to mention the illegal trade of organs and human organs to your elite. What about pedophilia? Is that allowed in Islam? Well, it actually is because as we already talked about and went over, according to the Hadith itself, Aisha, which is one of the wives of Muhammad, was how old? Seven years old when she married Muhammad and then taken to his house as a bride when she was nine years old also. The Quran also permits it with prepubescent girls who have not yet menstruated, and it's here in Quran Surah 65 verse 4 where it says, and as for those of your women who have not despaired of menstruation, if you have a doubt, their prescribed time shall be three months, and of those two who have not had their courses, and as for the pregnant women, their prescribed time is that they lay down their burden, and whoever is careful of his duty to Allah, he will make easy for him his affair. This is of course what? Rooted in Satan that's who this is. Muhammad fits the clinical description and definition of what's called a pedophile according to the Psychiatry Online Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, and notice how they're trying to make this seem like a mental disorder because they're trying to what? Spread and promote lawlessness through religion like they've been doing. Because according to them, pedophilia is considered over a period of at least six months recurring intense sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving sexual activity with the prepubescent child or children generally aged 13 years or younger. The person has acted on these sexual urges or the person is at least 16 years old and at least five years older than the child or children in criterion A. And what about necrophilia? Well, back in the spring of 2012, Egypt attempted to pass a farewell intercourse law legalizing sex with one's wife six hours after her death, but of course this was repealed.
There's even a hadith where it even says that Muhammad took off his shirt and placed it on a dead woman to lay with her in her grave. The grave diggers then proceeded to hurl dirt atop the corpse and the prophet exclaiming, quote, O oh, prophet, we see you doing a thing you never did with anyone else. To which Muhammad responded, quote, I've dressed her in my shirt so that she may be dressed in heavenly robes according to this. And I've laid with her in her grave so that the pressures of the grave may be alleviated from her. Do you see this more like what? False prophet come the end times this stuff is already prepared but now is the time to see the truth about islam the whole truth and nothing but the truth see the paganisms the pagan roots and the pagan origins and to come out of these paganisms come out of babylon and be separate from these paganisms so that you do not partake in the plagues and the punishments that's coming upon those who are still in babylon which is mystery babylonian religion paganisms traditions and cultures islam included christianity included all religions included where does all of this stem from where do all of these paganisms stem from the pope rome vatican that's where it all stems from and here's the black pope right here from the jesuits known as who are two rososa but that's where all of these religions stem from and now we're getting to the root of it and you're seeing the whole truth and nothing but the truth note the cross right here crossing out salvation crossing out salvation from the hearts and minds including with islam not anymore be deceived no more here in the nation of islam it's also time to come out of that too and i'm going to tell you why because farrakhan has even told you the truth about your true identity and who you really are if you are watching this video and involved with the nation of islam that you are actually the true children of yasharal and now it's time to return to your culture and return to your heritage that is the scripture because yes the scripture is a history book about so-called black people about so-called african americans and now it's time to return to our true creator, Yahuwah, through his true son, Yahusha. Also, this message is for all those who are being tormented, all those who are being persecuted because of Islam and because of all of the Sharia law that's going on. And this is to all those even so-called African migrants all around the world who are being persecuted right now, including the Rohingya. Have you ever stopped and wondered why the torturing is going on? Have you ever stopped and wondered why the torment and the abuse is going on? Well, scripture clearly tells us is because the children of Yasharal overall as a nation who are so-called black people, African Americans, who are scattered across the four corners of the earth in the Arab world and in places such as Asia, even in Myanmar, and now throughout the islands and coastlands who experience the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 because our ancestors did not obey the Torah that was given to them by Musa, Masha, Moses, the first five books of scripture, and because they committed idolatry, worshiping other idols and mighty ones, just like with A-L-L-A-H, L-O-R-D, G-O-D, and the list goes on. Because of this, that's why all of the plagues and punishments had to take place but there is great news indeed even if you're watching this and you're Muslim and also if you just so happen to be watching this in your Rohingya notice how you have what ya right there Rohingya Rohingya the name of our creator right there do you see it with both your eyes open so oh, then you're probably wondering then what is the truth because now that we just exposed Islam and all the other religions also and now that you've seen the cultural the historical and the spiritual side of Islam along with all the other religions and how they all are similar to one another well then what is the truth and what are you supposed to be doing and what are we supposed to be doing then now that we know the truth because remember this the truth will make you free I know that you have a ton of questions right now, and just like I told the Christians too, I care more about your salvation and deliverance than I do your feelings. So what are the next steps then?
The first thing to do is to come out of Babylon and to get away from all of the paganisms, all of the paganisms that are also known as these holidays or hella days, even ones including in Islam, such as the Hajj, such as Ramadan, partaking in Eid al-Adha, Ashura, and the list goes on. Now is the time to come out of that, come out of her, my people. This also means no more mosques because we've just proven that the mosque represents what? Pagan worship, giving homage to the devil, the moon deity. And also you see the statues right there and you see the crescent and the star giving homage to the devil and the phallic symbol right there. Just like a church steeple, now is the time to come out of these mosques, come out of Babylon, come out of the churches, come out of these Hindu temples and Buddhist temples and receive the truth. This also means doing away with the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad because just as we've gone over and proven in this video, Muhammad was demonically possessed and even on the cover of the Quran, do you see the reptilian right there? Who is that? That's the book of Satan inspired by Satan. It is satanic just as we have proven and now is the time to come out of that completely and completely abandon these teachings and also stop calling on this pagan title because what does this pagan title do it gives homage to the beast it gives homage to the serpent you're cursing the name of our creator and you're cursing the creator every time you pray to this title every time you give homage to this title and every time you come in the name of this title you are cursing our creator because that is what it means in the hebrew just as we've gone over now is the time to abandon these traditions traditions and say goodbye to religion period and to be free from the bondage that is religion because just as we've gone over religion means to bind again but now you are being free because the truth makes you free and the truth is being revealed to you today and now is the time to receive the great news of salvation and the great news of salvation is Yahuwah, the restored name for our creator and his son Yahusha, the restored name of our Messiah. No, it is not L-O-R-D. It is not G-O-D. It is not A-L-L-A-H as we have proven in this video and it is not J-E-S-U-S -S, as we've also proven and it is not I-S-A but rather Yahuwah Yahusha in the Paleo Hebrew, now is the time to receive the truth. And yes, names are very important, and this is the name of our Messiah, Yahusha, whom the builders have rejected. And now is the time to no longer reject truth and no longer harden your heart, but to allow Yahusha, our Messiah, who's knocking on the door of your heart to have an invitation with you and to sup with you if only you would let him and now is the time to open up your heart to our messiah yahusha to the father yahuwah because no one comes through to the father yahuwah except by our messiah yahusha and to have a real special relationship with our Messiah, Yahusha. And no, this is not the same as Christianity with having a relationship with JC, but rather the true Messiah of the scripture, Yahusha. Because just like we have relationships with our pets, our family members, our friends, and our neighbors, and etc., well, now is the time to have a relationship with our Creator through His Son, Yahusha. And the first thing to know is His name. And like I said, test it for yourself. Call upon his true name and see the truth for yourself and experience that real relationship that our creator wants to have with you and for you because we know the Messiah comes in his father's name and you do not receive him. If another comes in his own name, him you would receive. And we talked about that having to be J-C, I-S-A, A-L-L-A-H, and the list goes on. But we know the father's name is Yah, Yahu, just as we've seen even in the book of Zabur, the book of Psalms. 
And now it is time to follow and hearken to the true words of our Father and Messiah in the scriptures, the entire book of scriptures. So not just the Torah and not just the Psalms and not just the Angel or the Great News, what's commonly known as the New Testament, but the entire Old Testament and New Testament and really get a better understanding of the word and what our Father is truly saying. And we can start by the commandments and learning the law, statutes, and commandments that were given to Musa, Masha, Moses, when he was at Mount Sinai and when the children of Yasharal were delivered from the first Egypt, the first captivity, because we see we are to call upon his name, Yahua. And we can start this by keeping the first 10 commandments. Well, all religion breaks the first four commandments because the first commandments is that we are to have no other mighty ones before Yahua, well, having A-L-L-A-H or L-O-R-D, G-O-D, J-E-S-U-S, -S, or even ones such as Buddha and Krishna, that's breaking the first commandment. The second commandment is no graven images. And we've talked about how graven images, how the Roman Catholic Church B system, how they took out that commandment, adding and taking away, but having a graven image such as a cross, which represents the dead in Christianity, having prayer beads in Islam, Catholicism, Hinduism, and even Buddhism breaks that commandment. And also too, the hand of Fatima breaks that commandment also. Keeping the third commandment, which says not to take the name of our creator in vain while calling on A-L-L-A-H or J-E-S-U-S -S or any of those pagan titles that we've gone over and exposed is breaking the third commandment because our creator says that he will not hold anyone guiltless who takes his name in vain. And for those who are still saying that, oh, it does not matter. Oh, he knows my heart. Oh, he understands. Oh, we cannot learn the Hebrew. Oh, excuse here. Oh, excuse there. I'm telling you, it's time to wake up and break out of these deceptions, break out of these delusions right now. And the fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath or the Shabbat the seventh day of rest. Well, Christianity breaks that with Sunday sun worship. And as we've talked about the beast system known as the Roman Catholic Church, what they did is that they changed commandments, adding and taking away by making a pagan day, the day of worship and the day of rest when it is in fact not making it L-O-R-D's day. Well, L-O-R-D just so happens to mean Baal. And then try to justify by saying, oh, but the Messiah was resurrected on Easter Sunday, even though that's not true either. And I've covered a video on that showing you and proving, even with the Greek itself, that the Messiah, Yahusha, was actually resurrected on the Sabbath, the Shabbat, because he says that he is the master of the Sabbath. But see, they tried to hide that from you deliberately, but not anymore. So what are we to do then? What are we now to do now that we know the truth and now that the truth will make us free? Well, we are to be immersed in the restored name Yahuwah for our father and Yahusha for the son come out of these paganisms, which are these religions and be washed from the impurities of the world known as Babylon and all of her disgusting pagan rituals and traditions. Once we have done so, we can then receive the Ruk Akadash or what's commonly known as the Holy Spirit and be cleansed and be grafted back into the house of Yasharal commonly known as the house of Israel because Yahusha our Messiah says that he's only come but for the house of Yasharal or what you know as Israel. And what makes someone Yasharal? Who is considered someone who is of Yasharal? Someone who is crossed over from this pagan world into the truth because the word of our creator, Yahua, is the truth. Yahusha is the word made flesh, the living word, and Yahusha is the way, the truth, and the kaya, the life. And if you're so-called black or so-called African-American watching this video affected by the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and or Leviticus 26, then you are actually the fulfillment in the scriptural people of the book. And therefore, now you have the opportunity to graft on to Yasharal and be regrafted in by keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. But for those who are not so-called black, is salvation available to those anyone else? Of course it is, because you can be regrafted in through Yahusha. 
by keeping the law, statutes, and commandments that are outlined and highlighted in the first five books of scripture, commonly known as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you would like to learn more about who the true chosen people of scripture really are, please check out my video and my playlist on who the real scriptural people are, historically speaking, because it is not those Jewish people that you see today. That is another lie in Revelation chapter 2 verses 9 and Revelation chapter 3 verses 9 also proves that, but that they are the synagogues of Satan who say they are Yahudim or Jews and are not, but do lie. So now is the time to pray, repent, and then keep the law, statutes, and commandments so that you too can have an opportunity of eternal kaya, eternal life. And like I said, with prayer, just call out on the name Yahua and the name of Yahusha. Repent of all of your iniquities and transgressions. Get on your knees to repent indeed, and then let Yahua through Yahusha continue to lead and guide you in the way to go get you started some of the laws even include the sabbath seventh day of rest just like the fourth commandment instructs us which runs from friday evening to saturday evening so on this date because the hebrew days begin in the evening from sundown to sundown we then rest so for six days we work but then on that seventh day beginning on friday evening at sundown is the sabbath day of resting where there is to be no work and if you would like to learn more about that please Please read Exodus or Shamuth chapter 20. And now that it's time to abandon all of these pagan hella days, even the ones such as Christmas and Easter and all of the other ones, including the ones in Islam, such as the Hajj, such as Eid al-Adha, Ashura, and the list goes on. But now we can follow the scriptural feasts that are outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. And also understanding the clean and unclean foods and the foods that are not permitted. So no more pork, no more shellfish, no more any of those disgusting foods. And you can read more about that in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. I've also covered a playlist called Torah Truth with the Torah Truth playlist where you can find even more truth about these things in the Torah. So if you would like to take a look at that, please do also linked in the description box. But not only must we keep the law, statutes, and commandments that are outlined in the first five books of scripture, we must also keep and have the witness of our Messiah, Yahusha, and accept Yahusha as our perfect Passover lamb. I know that the Quran has told you, as they call him ISA, I know that the Quran says, that the true Messiah did not die, but that he just ascended into heaven and that was it, and that he's only just a prophet and that he's not the son of our creator. I'm here to tell you that that is pure blasphemy because the scripture tells you everything you need to know about Yahusha. That is why we need to get away from the Quran and all religion, period in order to understand the truth because Yahusha is the way and the truth and the kaya, the life. And those of us who believe in Yahusha have everlasting eternal kaya, eternal life. So who is Yahusha? And you can read about this in the scripture. Again, this is Yahusha. This is not JC because this is the restored name of our Messiah. And no, this is not a religion. Jewish people have told you, oh, but the name is too sacred to say. They did that because they do not want you to know the truth, the restored name. So who is Yahusha, our Messiah? Yahusha is our Passover lamb. And the scripture tells you this also, that Yahusha came in the flesh. And what did he do? Yahusha atoned for all of our iniquities and transgressions. Yahusha died and was hung on a tree and was then resurrected after three days, resurrected on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and came into the world as our Passover lamb in order to atone for all of our iniquities and transgressions and to become our perfect Passover lamb. And those of us who believe in Yahusha, with the blood of Yahusha, we too can enter into eternal kaya, eternal life. But that is only possible if we believe and accept Yahusha as our sovereign and as our savior, the one who came and who's come to save us from all of our iniquities and transgressions and to save us from from the wickedness of this world. But Yahusha is more than just a mere prophet. Yahusha is the son of all. Yahusha is Yahuwah in the flesh indeed. 
And when we accept Yahusha and accept his word and accept his promise of eternal Kaya, which is the great news, the Bashura, the real great news and not the lawless JC, when we accept Yahusha, our Passover lamb, into our hearts, and when we have the Passover lamb on our doorposts, which is our hearts, then we are protected and guarded from all evil and we too have the light and can be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And we too will receive the promise and the gift of eternal Kaya and our Amuna belief in Yahusha and obedience to his word by keeping his law, statutes, and commandments and even what Yahusha instructs us to do which is to love Yahuwah our creator with all our heart and with all our being and with all our might and to love our neighbor as ourselves and to keep his word and that's why the scripture tells us what transgression is transgression means anything that is against the law the word of Yahuwah also Yahusha who is the living word the word made flesh and I know they've brainwashed you into thinking that this is a religion. No, this is not a religion. This is having a real relationship with our creator by calling upon his name and getting to know our creator, getting to know the one who knows the number of hairs on your head, getting to know the one who knows how many veins are in your body, getting to know the one who has breathed Kaya life into you, getting to know the one who wants to have a real special relationship with you. Does doesn't it mean the world to you that our true creator wants to have a real relationship with you and is opening his heart unto you and is knocking on your doorposts even as we speak wanting to have a relationship with you but the question is will you answer and accept Yahusha as your perfect Passover lamb the one who came to die and atone for all of your iniquities and transgressions so that you can live again and have eternal Kaya and accept Yahusha as your sovereign and savior, will you do this and get away from all the religion and paganisms? So that you too can be born again of the Ruk Akadash, or what's commonly known as the Holy Spirit, being born again and being grafted into the house of Yasharal, accepting Yahusha, our Passover lamb, and not JC, the earth pig, as our sovereign savior, and keeping his laws, commands, and ways, and accepting the truth, because remember this, the truth will make you free and also immersions and getting immersed in the restored names of Yahuwah our creator Yahusha the son and the Ruk Akadash even as we saw with Yahusha himself by Yahukanan or what you know as Yahya by John the Immerser or John the Baptist and if you are interested in this, please email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com. Again, my email is truthunveiled77, that's two sevens, at gmail.com. Place immersion in the title. Also, if you are interested in having a copy of the scriptures that use the restored names of our creator, Yahuwah, and the restored name of the son, Yahusha, and getting away from these scriptures such as the KJV and all the other ones that still call on pagan titles, if you are interested in having these scriptures in order to better have a relationship with our creator, Yahuwah, through our Messiah, Yahusha, please email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com and place scriptures in the title or if you have any questions whatsoever please feel free to email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com and to close this video I would like to quote from a few verses in scripture first in Yashayahu Isaiah chapter 58 verse 9 where it says then when you call Yahuwah would answer when you cry he would say here I am Another one, which is Yahukanan, John chapter 8, verse 12, that says, Therefore Yahusha spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of Kaya, the light of life, because Yahusha is the way, truth, and the Kaya, the life. No one gets through to the Father but by Yahusha.
There is no other savior but Yahuwah because Yahusha's name means in the Hebrew to the English that Yahuwah is salvation. Yahuwah saves. That's what the name Yahusha actually means. Now we're here in Yarm Yahu, Jeremiah 6.16, which says, Thus said Yahuwah, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for yourselves. Mathatha Yahu, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 17, and see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting kaya or life? And he, Yahusha, said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Alua, but if you wish to enter into kaya life, guard the commands. Debarayim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 through 8. This is our creator, Yahuwah, speaking. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the barakah, the blessing, and the curse which I have placed before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the nations where Yahuwah, your Alua, drives you, and shall turn back to Yahuwah, your Alua, and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children. Children, then Yahuwah your Alua shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Alua has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the Shamayim, or what's commonly known as heavens, from there Yahuwah your Alua does gather you, and from there he does take you. And Yahuwah your Alua shall bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he shall do good to you, and increase you more than your fathers. And Yahuwah your Alua shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, to love Yahuwah your Alua with all your heart and with all your being, so that you might live. And Yahuwah your Alua shall put all these curses on your enemies and those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall turn back and obey the voice of Yahuwah and do all his commands which I command you today. And that's how we enter into the tree of Kaya, the tree of life, by doing and keeping the commandments of our creator, Yahuwah, keeping his law, statutes, and commandments, the entire scriptures, and also the witness, Amuna, the belief of Yahusha. This is the great news, and this is the true great news, and the truth has been revealed to you today and to love one another and to forgive one another. And that's why I've sat here and spent how many hours with you sharing with you the great news because you need to see the great news for yourself because the truth is what will make you free indeed and break those strongholds of religion that have just been exposed to you today. But if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com. This is Truth Unveiled here saying as always, Peace, love, and shalom.